Hopefully this time I don't have to paint around, paint around two cameras. We'll see. I don't know how safe it is to clip a camera to a cell phone. Everything's so awkward that it's just nothing is really that intuitive. That worked. Of course, you're not looking at Zoom, so you have no idea what I'm talking about. Or uh, Facebook, so you have no idea what I'm talking about. But, no, I don't. Eh, I'm only, I guess I'm assuming that. <laughs> What's nice about Zoom, or I said it again, YouTube, is that um, I can see the still life in the shot. Can you see the shot? You can't see it at all, can you? Oh, uh, because the darn second camera was covering the darn it. Yeah. That almost worked. Ah, darn. This is going to be a, an adventure as always. Damn it, that's where the camera is. Ha! Ha ha ha! Every time I get. I got to stop making my bragging noise. <laughs> Every time I do that, every time I do that, I get myself in trouble. Um, darn, that's that's perfect for YouTube, but it's not perfect for you on Zoom. All right, is that a compromise? You can see what I'm doing, right? I can see your board. Yes. You can see the board. You can see my mixing stand. That doesn't help. Yeah, I just don't know what the setup is, which is okay. Well, I'll show you what the setup is because I'm pretty sure I can make this work now. Can you see? Eggs and, and glasses? Uh, eggs and glasses. And egg glass. Oh, yeah, but it's kind of far away. Yeah, I mean, I have. Ah, I'm going to mess something up. Yeah, don't, don't do that. Don't mess yourself up. I could share the screen with a photo. How do I. Hmm. How about? Um, no, I can do this. I can do this. I can. Um, ah, I know. I know just what to do. And then I'm gonna be a little late getting started, but there's nobody watching, so. I, I mean, sorry, you are watching, but there's nobody else watching. So you'll. <laughs> so you'll be patient. I hope. And what happened? I took the shot. Oh man. Alright, um Okay. Well then I'll take the shot again. Alright, so here we go. Bear with me for just a second. Oh man, that's a wild adventure. Look at you. Look at me. I see. You see me. Okay. Well now I don't see you, but I did see you. Alright. I might want more directional shadows, but I'll send that to my drive, and when I send it to my drive, I will, um, I can put it in the chat, or like a link for it in the chat, maybe, unless, unless you think of a better way. I'm just eager to get started is the problem. Shoot, I'm already in low power mode. Okay, so here I'm back to the screen, and I gotta get the other camera back on because I just knocked it to the ground and it hopefully it still works. It looks like it. And not cover the camera. Check. All right, so can you see the board? Um, not, a, not all of it. Yeah, now I can. That's good, and that's good for that's good for Zoom. Or did it again? Darn it. That's good for. You know what I'm trying to say. I think so. Um, YouTube. Okay, this is great. I just went full screen, so yeah, I see well. Okay, good. All right, so I'm just going to get started with an underpainting, and then I can take a break for the rest of the paint. Like I said, I'm a little behind. 
but happy to have such wonderful guests with me. You. I'm talking about you. <laughs> that's this so far, but that's okay. Well, that'd, that'd be great, having international presence. I know, that's what you want, right? Yeah, of course. All right, so, uh, did, you, did you see the last video I put up? No. Uh, the avocados? Yeah, but um, it was cool. I, I mean, I had the idea, I'm sure somebody else has done it, but, you know, it's still an original idea. If, if it wasn't like directly pulled from somebody, but I, I dubbed it, I edited it from back to front, like I went backwards. So it started with the final details and then brush strokes were removed until it was back to scratch. And then I just let it go super speed from start to finish again. And I thought it was pretty cool, but um, yeah, you just never know. It's like, I can think something's really cool and it doesn't work for anybody else. But I got nice feedback from somebody who watched it and said it was genius. So wow, that's good. I like hearing that. What I should have done is invited that person here tonight. But you know, I, I see these things in passing while I'm between teaching and kids in frame shop. And yeah, you know, I just got them down not too long ago. We read some Two Towers and uh, read Ollie some books, and he was just going bonkers. And I just needed like a, I don't know, just a little. A little break from all the action before I got down here. So that was all my time. And I threw up together a still life in haste. But I like it. Haste doesn't necessarily mean bad composition. I just uh, put it together pretty fast is all I meant to say. Well, you, you know, you do a good job doing that because um, the last time that you set up all those still lifes for us, Really fast. But you know, I have a much easier time setting up for other people than I do setting up for myself. Well, just pretend you're doing it for somebody else. I, I wish. Because you're really good at it. Oh, well, I appreciate your feedback. And I believe it, you know, honestly, I did like those. I mean, I, I kind of agree with you without trying to sound super arrogant. It's just, uh, I, uh, oh man, I don't like my still life from here. Nice. What am I going to do? All right. I got to do something. All right. I got to tweak this still life. Uh, I can see it in YouTube. Hey, there's somebody watching on YouTube. Awesome. So I just want to pull that shell out a little bit so I can see it better. I don't want to cover up both ellipses, but I do like the cracky egg with the nice glow on the inside. I might change my lamp. Oh, that's my lamp. That's where the double shadow is coming from. So I need to put, oh, that's blowing. Thanks. Uh, I need to put tin foil on my lamp and then I'm off to the races, painting the fastest still life I can. What does the tin foil do? It blocks the light, so we only have one light source. It's especially helpful in the studio when you have like two people next to each other and you don't want one person's light into the other. I mean, there's... Yeah, it just blocks the light. Yeah, so I have a lamp hitting my setup and I have a... What happened? Oh man, the video... <laughs> I, I changed the light source so that it's like super bright and now on on YouTube it's like completely washed out. <laughs> I wonder if uh here I'll just shift it a little bit for you. Can you see this delay? Oh yeah. It is it completely washed out? No. Oh really? You can see it pretty well on uh, Instagram? Yeah, when you showed it to me a minute ago, I well, can't see it now. On my yeah, yeah, I, I moved it. Can you see what I'm doing? Yeah, okay. So yeah, on YouTube, it went from being seen pretty clear, albeit in the background, to uh, being completely washed out. All right, so uh, here we go. I'm gonna get started. What's that? 
Welcome to the chat. Welcome to the Friday. Yeah, it is washed out, Dan. <laughs> I don't know what to do about it though. So hopefully the, the hopefully the still life will speak for itself when I get further in, or maybe I can just take a small break to uh, put it into focus. Great. Welcome, welcome. Okay, so right now I'm just doing mass conception. What's that? Hi, Chio. Oh, hi, hello, I'm with his friend. Great. And I live in Cambodia at the moment. Um, so sorry, my video is switched off, and I'm wondering if maybe next week I'll switch it off. Uh, thank you for uh, thanks for the information, man. You're welcome. Uh, pleasure to meet you, Hans. Yeah, nice to meet you too. That's that's thrilling. I've got I've got uh, somebody wants to watch from Cambodia. <laughs> Okay. Well, I'm an art producer. Yep. <laughs> and I do this, I do these pretty fast. Uh, you know, some of them take a little longer, maybe up to like four and a half hours, like that uh, squash painting. Uh, but the, the one last week was pretty much three hours. The, the one before that was uh, maybe a little bit longer, but not from the painting, but because of the technical difficulties. Like, remember I fussed with uh, YouTube for so long to get it to work? Yeah. All right, so this stage... Oh, you good? I was just going to say, that's why I suggested to Chino that she do the Zoom, because sometimes there's, you know, there's a little bit of trouble with the YouTube stuff. Well, this, I, I figured out, I think, I think, I hope, what was going wrong was that... Um, it was just that it would it would say that everything's fine. It would say that you know the it would put the image up and everything, but then it would um, the Instagram would steal the camera. But it didn't seem like anything was wrong because the feed was still coming in from uh, Instagram. So it was it didn't make any sense to me. But so far so good because I can see that YouTube is up and running. But it would is bizarre because I. Because I'm concentrating on my painting, I couldn't see the moment where the cameras, you know, would turn black. And then they could hear me, but they couldn't see me. And, of course, that's no good for watching an art video. <laughs> that's really not good. All right, so I think, I'm thinking that this composition isn't quite what I want yet. Um, I do want the space for all the eggs. What I could do, the reason I'm going to keep going is because I I like I embrace mistakes. I don't I don't feel like I need to measure everything because I like the painting itself to have a little bit of a voice. And I make mistakes because of lack of clarity. So I don't want to get rid of the mistake first. I even hesitate to call it a mistake, but um, I hesitate to get rid of these uh, marks that I want to change right off the bat because. It, it provides something to react to, something to uh, decide what I do want from what I don't want. And um, I have a bunch of options that are already kind of brewing in my mind, like, do I just make the eggs smaller relatively? Because they don't have to be life size. Or do I shift the whole thing? It depends on how much negative space here and how much I want. I know I don't want to run anything off the composition, so I'm going to have that in my mind as I make my decision. So I think I know where I want to go, but I'm still going to be open to the possibility that, you know, I can be surprised in a pleasant way. And, uh, you know, maybe this, uh, this painting will suggest something I didn't think of before or open up a new possibility. Um, and we'll see. So I am still leaning toward making the uh, eggs smaller. I want to maximize the, the width, but I don't want it to um, don't want it to be so tight on the edges. So the correction isn't so bad. I'm just going to take all of my drawing lines and make them a little smaller. 
the scale for the eggs wasn't really working for the uh, glass anyway. And again, it's just, it's not that I should have gotten it right. I didn't have much information to go for. It's just that I'm going to make the corrections to find what I do ideally want. And this is the stage to do it because it's just nothing's committed to. There's no soft edges or dramatic colors or uh, detail. It's just simply a design right now. Okay, so now I can end this little shell. Of course, I can do whatever I want. Nobody's gonna really tell me what the cracked egg should have looked like, but I'm gonna loosely follow what's there without feeling beholden to the setup. So when I can copy at least roughly what I see, then I can take quick glances and observe. If I change it radically, then I, I, my quick glances have to be then converted to uh, this other, you know, the reality of what's really there. Or sorry, uh, opposite. It has to be converted from reality to my interpretation, which is perfectly fine in some circumstances, but I'd much rather just observe right now. Sometimes you really want what's in front of you that that your own version might not be, you know, ideal. So this is not the stage to be stuck with anything. It's the stage to get your simple design right. And that's what keeping it simple is, is crucial. Because as soon as you start developing it, then it's, you know, you kind of wed to it. You kind of get your ego attached. And uh, it just cuts off possibilities, like having that detail, perfect detailed eye in a portrait. And you just, you will, you will sacrifice the whole painting to save that beautiful eye. It's just not worth it. So if I got a really nice, simple socket, you know, nice light and shadow design based on the light source and the, and the model's true eye rather than some kind of theoretical eye, then, you know, I can move that as much as I want and not feel like I've lost any effort or time or, you know, that frustration of losing something that looks really nice. So I really, really love this simple face. All right. So all this is, uh, none of it's set in stone. One of these days I'm going to shift the light source a little bit more. This, this lamp, these, uh, I have the lamps on tracks and the track kind of with the camera in the position that it's in, in order for me to get both cameras working simultaneously, uh, it kind of gives me almost straight down light. I mean, it's barely left to right. And, it would be more dramatic if the light were uh, more raking. But I don't know. It's, it's not such a big deal because it, it does look nice and dramatic. If I had nice longer shadows, uh, it'd probably sell the three-dimensional form a little bit better. And um, yeah, I, I generally like that better. All right, cool. So we're almost at eye level at the top of the glass. I'm just gonna see a sliver up here. I have my center line for just quickly assessing two halves. Um, I'm gonna clean up that line just cause it's a little heavy. Anytime um, you make the corrective mark or uh, you, know, you start letting the paint run out on the tip of the brush, then the, the line can start getting a little heavy and sloppy. And then it's just not really super clear as to where the, the edge is. I'd rather be really clear at this stage. I'd rather do that. Uh, I'd rather have clarity over style at this, at this point. I'm going to get style later. Style happens pretty late for me. I don't worry about style for quite a long time. Uh, and when I do a style note, it's not even the same every time. It's just kind of a, a lot of times just inspired to do something a little a little, you know, more based on inspiration than some kind of formula. All right, so I'm starting to like this. I have room for putting just a little hint of reflections, which I like that. I'm not going to do a table edge because I just don't, I feel like that space would be pretty tight. 
if I'm maximizing the widths, then I don't want to go any higher for the glass. I think it'd be better if everything shifted over. And again, this, this stage is all about getting ideally what you want on the simple design. So I think that's worth doing even at the expense of time. If I lose a little bit of time for detail, I think that's better than settling for a composition I don't want. I'm not going to necessarily say good or bad. I mean, for one, that's eye of the beholder. And two, you know, it's a little early in the process to say if this composition really works or not, but um, I already know some things about what I am liking and not liking. So I'm going to just move all my lines over by about, you know, an eighth, three sixteenths, something like that. And um, again, this is way too early to settle for a composition that isn't ideally what I want. A lot of people consider thirds. I do too. I just don't, I'm not wed to them. So if I had to, if I had to just knock this into thirds, I mean, I'm kind of like right on the edge of a third right here. And the other one's right on the edge of the glass there too. We're based almost on a third right here. This one's not being used so much. So what? Um, again, I'm not beholden to thirds. I'm not beholden to anything really. When you when you really get adept at the art fundamentals, you can create, you can break all the rules in just the right ways. And I, I like to, I don't know, I like to push the edge of what some compositions can do because. I don't know. If anything, everyone had the same composition based on the same rules. I think that'd be pretty boring. Uh, I actually have some paintings. In fact, Liz, you have one. I actually have some paintings that, um, you know, just really intentionally break the rules just because they're, uh, it's just part of the meaning of the work. So the painting that I did clicks, which is one of those YouTube videos, um, I mean, that has, that has a, a really prominent spot of the painting, perfectly symmetrical in the middle of the painting. And it's like, by most compositional standards, that's awful. It's like symmetrical and evenly spaced. That was kind of on purpose because it's a story, it's a it's kind of a narrative about uh, how like groups of similar people form into cliques. And so it's like, the symmetry helps for that selling of that idea of the, the sort of wild uh, decorative gourds on one side forming a click and the uh, grocery store gourds forming a, another click on the other side. I had another painting called uh, Inner uh, Ugly Fruit Inner Beauty, which is uh, Ugly Fruit is U G L I. It's the, it's kind of a, looks like, it's kind of like a grapefruit. But, uh, I have one that's peeled and one that's fully together. And because it's a two part uh, title, uh, I, I made it almost like two, two equal paintings on both sides. So again, just those would be, normally be considered, uh, you know, bad composition, but you know, maybe it comes across that way to some people, but for me, it's exactly what I wanted to, so, you know, paint the painting that you want. Uh, but don't do it from ignorance or what you're stuck with. Do it from that's this is uniquely what I want. Um, and you know that you know that if you don't rush this stage because you can actually see what you're doing. All right, it is a little slow to watch. So I'm gonna I do get the the next phase is really about pushing the early. Uh, you know, sort of dramatic moments of the painting. And so I'm going to fall short of getting a perfect drawing because I'm going to lose these lines anyway. But I just want to know where I'm going and what the negative spaces look like. They're just impor as important as positive shapes at this point. Uh, the symmetrical glass is, uh, if it got thinner on this side, I can just thin this side. That's the beauty of a center line. There's a 
little sliver of water right here. And another little sliver of like this thick glass on the bottom. That looks maybe a little even. Maybe I need to drink a little bit of that water. Or I'll just or I'll just raise it, you know. All right. Um yeah, I mean that's almost perfectly bisected. I'm gonna raise the top of the glass just slightly. I think you have the room to do it. The other thing about tops of compositions, I don't think very many people consider frames, but uh, many, many frames will um, cast a shadow. So that top of the glass, I feel like is pretty important. And if the top of the glass is important, then I don't want it to be in the shadow of the frame. All right, so I'm going to just create a little bit of asymmetry here, not equal thirds. And this is kind of arbitrary because it's it's the type of glass. It's not like a recognizable type of glass. It's just this unique glass, you know, drinking glass that, you know, has this huge thick area right here for, um, I mean, just the base of the glass. So I can put that wherever I want, really. All right, so uh, I roughly have the design that I want. So I'm just gonna reinforce some of the lines and then I'm gonna uh, get some paint on my palette and really attack this thing. The next stage I use is not uh, any sort of detail either. It's gonna be abstract simplification. So uh, I, think, I think everybody who paints realism advocates for squinting, I do. In a, in a way that embraces the abstract quality of it. Like I, I don't want to think of egg shapes. I want to think of what is that genuine shape that's in front of me. And uh, if I'm painting a portrait, I don't want to think about what an eye looks like because there's a real shape in front of me. I don't want to think about, you know, what is a, a tree or a dog or whatever I'm painting. I don't want to, I don't want to get pre clouded by what I think things look like. And that's what makes it abstract. Because whatever that unique pattern is probably won't look exactly like a, a whatever. Uh, so I'm reinforcing some of these lines because they got a little sloppy. So I can tell where I'm going, but by the time I get paint on my palette, maybe I'll forget exactly what represents what. So I want a lot of clarity here. I generally don't block in with such a tiny little detail brush, but um, Again, I, I don't follow rigid protocols. I, I think about how do I get efficiently to a finished product using the fine art fundamentals and create something hopefully visually stimulating for a viewer. Because honestly, a, a, a collection of cracked eggs in front of a drinking glass isn't going to uh, be written about in philosophical journals for the epic of time. <laughs> so, so I better make it somewhat dramatic to make this worth looking at. All right, so now I'm getting just a little structure in there. I do have the room for this shell now, and I do consider things like the frame and um, I didn't have it before. You saw me shift everything equally. It wasn't a complete redraw because I could use the old shapes to just shift everything by what I already had. Just if it moves an eighth of an inch on one side, it's going to move by an eighth on the other side. So all the preliminary marks, none of them were considered mistakes. They helped me big time. Go from not really knowing how to fill the compositional space exactly the way I wanted to to something that gave me a lot more clarity. Now, I might still make some creative decisions because I like the painting to have its own voice. I, I know that sounds a little funny, but um, there's gonna be there's gonna be a lot of moments that I just didn't, you know, I didn't see coming. And that's that's not for lack of experience. I mean, I've been at this for a very long time, so I just. I just know that there's going to be some things that um, I didn't I didn't uh, anticipate. All 
Can you see the uh, screen? Yeah, I can see it now. Okay, cool. Happy to, happy to have you all on the on watching. Thanks for joining me. I uh, just muted somebody. I didn't want anyone to take offense to that. I just. And of course, I appreciate that, Liz. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to a place of clarity. I'm going to put out pain as fast as I possibly can. There's some cool moments in this, even though they're, you know, the humble egg. Um, there's some wild reflected light going on in here and here. Love it. And there's really sharp, bright exchanges of contrast. The inside of an eggshell is uh, really luminous in the shadows because of all that reflected light, so I can't... Uh, can't wait to get to that. And then sharp edges uh, can be really exciting. And the eggshells are uh, going to be just instantly cutting from light to dark in those, uh, you know, cracked shells. So if I didn't spend a little extra time with my kids getting them to bed, I'd have to be fully ready to rock and roll, but I just have to read, I have to put some paint on my palette and then this thing is gonna really fly. So the edges are really cool. They're they're nice and jagged. Like I wasn't super careful uh, cracking these open for that reason. And uh, I'm not gonna bother drawing it now because if I drew little tiny shapes like that, I'd either have to paint so carefully that uh, I avoid them, or I'll just lose it, and then I've been a waste of time. So I'm not going to waste my time. I'm going to get to that after I've blocked in the environment so that I can just superimpose that edge over the environment. And I'll, I'll tell everybody, you know, kind of how to pull that off wet into wet to get a really sharp detail. I mean, it's not a secret. It's just, uh, it's just the, the the thickness of the paint. And so, if you create a single brush stroke over wet paint, it just has to simply be thicker than that previous layer. So, the the trick is to do single brush strokes. I mean, again, not a secret, but it's it's hard to think about while you're in the moment, especially in all prima. It's like, well, how am I going to get a sharp edge with high contrast on a wet painting and not make mud? Well, it just has to sit on the top surface. So what people do, uh, you know, almost unconsciously is they just keep hacking away with, uh, they load up the brush and just make, I don't know, scumble, 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 scumble. And then um, they, they don't. They don't make that intentional bold brush stroke that they want because it's, it it transferred all the paint from the brush onto the surface, and it's no longer thicker than the pre the painting layer underneath. And once that happens, you're just mixing paint on the surface. It's just smashing together. So if I can be really conscious about the the paint load on the tip of the brush, I can be able I can mix it intentionally if I want to transition softly or I can lay a bold brush stroke on top. I can put complementary colors right on top of each other without making mud. If I'm just a little thicker and I, I relegate the brush strokes to one, maybe two. And that's really natural for me now. That might feel a little foreign to people uh, getting started. Uh, so if you're real experienced, yeah, that's probably like a, a no duh type thing, but to actually do it, to actually uh, be aware of the paint load, um, I might actually eliminate this. I don't like these thirds. In reality, in reality, the glass is just bigger, but I don't want to, I don't want to go too big, much bigger. I want to preserve this negative space. 
I don't know. I got to make a decision about that. I think I can actually push it below this point. Because I don't think anybody would know. I mean, this glass is a little quirky in that regard. So I pushed this up already. That, that worked a little bit, but um, didn't work completely. And again, you're going to, if you keep your eye open, like you don't feel like anything's set in stone, especially for this early simple stage, you can make all the creative decisions that you want without, you know, undoing a lot of detail and finesse. I'm going to lose a lot of the drawing lines in the glass anyway, but it's nice to have a plan. Um, especially with glass, I want to, I want to make sure that the background reads through it. So these lines might get obliterated. I might actually have to redraw it completely if, if I don't feel like being so, uh, in the big stage, big, big brushstroke phase, then be super careful about, you know, preserving detail. So if I lose the glass, I lose the glass. No big deal. I'll put it back in. Glass is more for transparent glass. Um, if you outline it or you make it too heavy, it's no longer glass. So I'm going to get my palette together super quick. And this thing is going to fill right in in no time. Next stage, this is just mass conception. Again, it doesn't really matter if it's an egg or a glass or whatever. It's going to be um, just simply how masses break down the rectangle. And then the next space is still abstract. That's going to be, oh, what happened? Okay, no, nothing. Um, the next stage is still abstract. That's uh, abstract simplification. So I'm going to squint at it. I'm going to paint uh, just the big color fields that I see when I squint. I'm going to ignore the rest. And then it's about five values. If I can get a story of the light in there that has a consistent direction, intensity, and color of the light, then I'm ready for soft edges and details or expressive brush strokes or blending and building or whatever style I feel like doing is accessible because it checks so many boxes for design first, um, the true characteristics of the, the simple shapes, the squint level shapes, and then the harmony of light going through the entire thing. I can do whatever I want at if I checked all those boxes first. And so that's where a personal expression can really flourish if you've got all those uh, really well marked. If you've scrutinized each step, that you don't rush these beginning stages, um, then you know you almost you almost can't make a mistake. Obviously, that's a little bit bold of a statement, but you have so much information already if you if you check those boxes. But again, that's not radical, um, but it is uh, it is something that people like to rush these beginning stages. If you learn to love abstraction for realistic realistic paintings, you can um, not only capture what's in front of you, but you can. Uh, leave a pathway for just really expressing yourself without compromise. I believe that completely. But I respect the other ways too. So uh, some other ways could be measuring systems like site size. I don't have anything bad to say about that. Some people like to trace photos and things like that. Yeah, I, I get it. The, the drawing part is hard, but if you struggle through that and, and just Embrace that there's going to be some growing pains. You're going to be better off for it learning to draw through struggle than letting a camera do the work for you. That's my opinion. I'm not, I'm not here to browbeat anybody. Um, but drawing is so fundamental. But uh, I'm going to let the painting do more talking than me. But, Anybody who doesn't know me probably is, oh, no, 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 Oh, shoot. About to lose my phone.
uh, it is not as plugged in as it used to be. All right, you still there? Yes. Okay, cool. All right. Um, uh, everyone I don't know, uh, feel free to chime in. I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Doesn't have to be art related, just, you know, whatever. We're here having fun. Like I said, it's a good time for letting the paint talk instead of me. So if we're talking about art stuff, that's cool. If it's non art stuff, that's cool too. Happy to hear from you. Time to go. So the one thing that I care the least about is preserving the glass because I want that to be transparent anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and get some big color fields in. Oh, it's reversed. That's why. Oh, no. Did I lose him? I think I did lose him. You mean on YouTube? Yeah. What happened? Because that's this. I thought I was watching YouTube, but I'm not. I'm watching um, Photo Booth because a lot of times. Okay, no, it's still on. Cool. All right. My computer. Yeah. So my I have a little bit of black oil on it. Um, that's my medium. I used to paint with Marajay medium. I still love it. It's just. I got accustomed to just putting a little bit of black oil on my palette and I'm gonna stretch the paint with that. But from right to left, I just have uh, titanium white. I prefer cremnants, but this is what I have. So titanium white, lemon, uh, cadmium lemon, cad yellow medium, cad red medium, alizarin crimson, yellow ochre, burnt sienna, raw umber. That's chrome green. I don't really like chrome green, but I don't know, whatever. I usually have sap instead. Uh, that's phthalo blue. I have ultramarine too. I might break that out later, but it's nice to have a warm blue and a cool blue. Phthalo is my warm blue. And there's black. Some people don't like black. I do. It's just a tool, in my opinion. It's not any sort of fancy system of uh, you know, the spectrum or anything. But I highly respect anybody who says, you know, I don't use black. Fine, right? I like it because it, it, it creates shadows that are really low in chroma. Uh, I don't like to use it pure, but um, I do like it a lot. So if I want uh, my my light, my midtone lights to be really rich in color, I don't want my shadows to be rich in color. And that system really works because uh, we don't see well in, in low light. And just go through your house without the lights on, and that's easy ver easily verifiable. So uh, I love umber for shadows, uh, raw umber, especially if it's a little bit on the warmer side. And I love, I love to mix uh, colors with black to gray them down and darken them uh, without adding too much chroma, like purples and blues and black, and uh, purples and blues and umbers and, uh, you know, some of those darker pigments other than black. Again, you can definitely overuse it, and it can look bad if you do, but I don't know. I think it's worth it to have on the pellet. So everything at this point is just simply a guess. I'm going to start from uh, sort of focal area, mid-tones. That's not nearly rich enough. And see, that, that dot tells me everything I need to know. So I'm going to stop, and I'm going to make that dot work. Kinda. That didn't work either. And however many times it takes to get the midtone that I want. I'm not going for any particular area on the arc of values of uh, the egg. It's kind of somewhere in between. And I like to err on the side of a little bit of the dark of middle and a little bit on the rich of color. So the next stage when I turn it into five values it's going to be um, D 
desaturated in the highlight. You know, as I add those bright opaques, it's going to get less intense of the color. And then it's going to get less intense of the color when I transition into the shadow with the turning grays. So for right now, just as a placeholder, there's a rich, you know, arguably a little bit dark middle tone. And uh, I'm going to modify it with bright highlights and I'm going to modify it again with turning grays and then find exactly what I need to do from there. So none of it's even remotely uh, concerning right now to be precise or, um, you know, some, somehow true to this egg. It's just somewhere in the middle of all those values. And um, the system is going to modify it from there. Some, some of these eggs, they're, they're going to have little slight variations of their kind of inherent color, their kind of core color. Uh, so I, I can definitely modify it that way. I'm not treating them as all as dime a dozen, but they, they're the simple version. When I squint, I don't see those little jagged edges, or at least I do, it's, it's minor. I do see the junction of light and shadow. And I see, uh, you know, uh, quite a, a lot of contrast between the shadow, uh, between the outside of the egg and the inside of the egg. So if I, uh, if I push the idea of darker middle tone, then I'm going to be a really good shape for creating high contrast. Now that, that the white parts of the shell are not my brightest light, only the highlight is. So I really want to stay away from keying it up too bright, not only for the white shell, but also for the uh, white inside part of the shell, but also for the sparkle of the glass. The glass has to be extraordinarily bright, possibly even brighter than the brightest highlight in the egg. So if I key up the middle tones too bright and I don't go uh, dark enough for the shadows, then I'm going to be, have, I'll have to, my only recourse will either be to redo all the tones that I started with or uh, to, um, key everything to pure white. I really don't want to do that. So there's a simple block in. When I'm looking at the focal areas, I, those are the simplest parts of the block in because I want them as a placeholder for, uh, I want them as a placeholder for all the environmental stuff, my secondary objects and my uh, environment. So I'm going to keep those super simple because they're, they're going to change as I get more information. But if I can base all of my uh, major decisions based on how I'm going to elevate the focal point, then, uh, then the secondary objects are, are kind of there to enhance the primary and all the uh, environment supports, you know, just further on the, the high, in the subject area, but also um, those secondary objects. So it's in priority, but all of them are extremely important. So a background can really kill your presentation of the, of the objects you really intended to shine. And if you can't, if you can't create a situation where you're guiding the eye to, to things that are extremely important, then, then really nothing seems like it's very important. Like, you, you know, what are you trying to, to do with the painting? And I, I like to, to think about, well, there's, there's this one place that's really going to make sure that the other objects aren't going to distract from this area or that area, right? It's not always that case, but that's, that's typically what I do. So I'm just taking guesses. Nothing is set. There's a quite a bit of glow in the shadows of these eggs that again, I'm just going for some, some kind of middle value that I'm going to modify by some areas get a little bit more of a glow than other areas. And I'm going to address that later. I don't know if it works yet. If you wanted to know by now if it works, then you could do a color study. 
you know, if you want to make sure that the drawing and the composition are exactly what you want, you could do that by now. You could have had a, a preliminary sketch that gets you, um, you know, you can work out all the kinks on the side. That's a really great thing to do. I tend not to do that, but uh, on my really complicated still lives and my like figure commissions and things like that, um, I think it's a wonderful way of of uh, getting started. On uh, my recent painting of the former First Lady of Maryland, I, I did preliminary sketches and then got those approved. And then I did color studies and got them approved. I did a grisaille of the overall painting to get that approved on the drawing level. I can move things around without, you know, color matching and things like that. And, you know, not keeping it all about the drawing rather than the, uh, the colors too. And uh, it worked really, really well that way. But all the Prima especially, but even a lot of still lives, I, I wouldn't do that preliminary work just because, I don't know, for one, I can, I can do a lot of problem solving on the painting itself. And for two, I kind of like to have the, the painting I don't know, open, open a suggestion. All right, so none of that is right. None of it's, you know, obviously wrong, but it's, it's still put in and, and left behind for right now. Because I wanna, I wanna just keep building fields of value. I'm doing it maybe a little less uh, boldly than I do sometimes. I know this subject pretty well. I've, I've done a lot of paintings with eggs. Um, and it's one that I can really go for, so. I, I kind of know the pitfalls of this subject matter, which is trying to preserve the intensity of those white highlights and the rim. The rim that uh, is going to be extremely bright as little outlines to create those sharp edges with high contrast and it will show that the, the eggshell itself has a thickness to it. Even though it's super thin, that thickness uh, really place, creates a lot of clarity. The other thing that's a little different than some of my other block -ins that might arguably more uh, be more aggressive is that this, this paint, I don't want this painting to be overly thick, uh, all because of those little little tiny cracks and uh, sharp edges. I want them to be able to go on pretty boldly without uh, you know without risking swimming in paint and having it mix right on the surface. I just I, I say this to the students a lot you just can't make a mistake at this point. Impossible. I mean especially impossible early on. Uh, you know, that mass conception phase. And that's part of what I love, really love about it. All right, so it doesn't look like much yet. I'll fully acknowledge that. But I see a lot of potential here. So um, the environment is really important, especially for the glass. And I need to decide, it's like, well, what? What am I going to do with the background? I kind of have a, a nice gray for my wall here. It, this is a, this is this space is meant for painting, so um, that gray is really nice to elevate bright colors, and I do like a lot of bright color. So the gray creates a foil for the color to read against. If the color is highly saturated and you know vibrant, it'll read even stronger against a dull gray. And um, I'm going to embrace that. Also, too, is this gray is important because normally the darkest darks are in the subject and not in the background. Like all those uh, all black backgrounds, they can look really nice. It's just not my way. I like um, I like the darkest dark and the lightest light to be within the subject matter for the most part. It doesn't always work out that way, but um, I'm. I'm using that as my operating premise. 
So until I find these values, everything's tentative. I'm just putting in enough information to uh, react to and adjust from simple to specific. As, uh, let's put it in, in a way that I just, I'm not going to protect anything. So my plan is that by the time I get over here, it's going to be a lot brighter. I'm going to keep it cool so that the, uh, you know, those worms of the egg are going to read. I need to be dark enough for that white. So that's that first guess as to how bright to go won't work. Because then I'd have to key up the inside of the egg too much. And it'll key it up too high for the sparkly highlights in the glass and the, uh, the other areas of highlight within the egg and the um, little edges, those edges of the shell that I think are going to be super important for this one. And um, those are the thoughts going through my mind right now. But nothing is set. I'm not going to be beholden to anything. The glass magnifies the background just a little, and it comes off as a little bit brighter than the background. I'm not saying that as a formula. I'm just saying in this setup. So. as a squint level shape, a lot of the glass just disappears. I want to make sure that happens. So I'm just going to establish some things that are found so that when I get to the areas that are lost, I don't lose too much structure. Uh, although, like I said before, I'm not worried about losing the drawing. I can just redraw it. It's not a big deal. Some things is definitely not worth it. And this, this glass, I'm not going to protect anything. So what's cool about the glass in this setup is that it's almost inverse. This is getting brighter than the background here to darker, and this is getting lighter than the background to darker here. That's really sort of neat. I'm going to embrace that. I'm going to put that in right off the bat. But I, I do want to make sure that it's not completely outlined. I'm going to lose some of these outlines into the background. And I'm just going to cover ground. All of it might have to get readjusted anyway as I refine the eggs. But the eggs have already been important in the decision making for the background, which is why I go in the order that I do. So I knew I had to be dark enough for that little mid tone of the white inside of the egg. And it had to be this dark. I already know that I want to go from lighter on this side to darker on that side. So I'm going to go ahead and adjust this to be darker. That's too dark, but I have a good plan that that was a bad execution. <laughs> Definitely happens. I like to paint right into the edges of form. I don't like to avoid them or be so meticulously careful that I paint perfectly on the edge. I'd rather just paint with a big old brush and not be terribly worried about it. And so all the little craggy edges of that egg, I kept that really simple. I'll draw that with fresh paint. I'm going to put a lot of reflected light into the glass too. It's just not on the squint level, so I don't have to worry about it yet. All right, so the table will round out my simple guesswork. And then it's time to really clarify this front egg as my focal point. And then um, I'll work my way out from this egg into these, into the glass, and then readjust all the background stuff. Is that, that somebody left? Yeah, Chico had to run some errands. Okay. It's probably a completely different time zone there, right? Yeah, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. 10 in the morning. Yeah, something like that. It's 
been an exhausting week. <laughs> so today, today I'm kind of dragging. I, I was laying in, uh, you know, trying to get the five year old to sleep, and uh, oh man, I was just like, you better really got to paint. <laughs> I love painting. I love having people join me. It's just, you know, it's been a particularly uh, bruising week for work. I hope I don't come off as like being super low energy. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. That's good. I'll speak for all of them. <laughs> Although I guess <laughs> I guess uh, they would speak with turning off the video. <laughs> Love having you here. <laughs> So I see this is pretty dull right now, but I see there's a lot of potential. And like I said, I'm in no rush to make this attractive yet. I'm just creating possibilities. Uh, with things like cast shadows, I like to make them a little on the generous side. I make them too big and then I cut back with the uh, environment. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I wanna, I'm making the table darker than I see it and that's on purpose because I'm gonna have these eggs reflecting. I think I mentioned that when, in my setup in the early parts is that um, this is keyed up, this is not keyed up, this is uh, placed a little high for the purpose of getting these subtle reflections into the table. And like I mentioned before, we're up a little high on the composition to um, create a table edge, so I'm not gonna do it. I've made that mistake before, or actually many times, is that when you put a table edge in and you don't have a whole lot of room, that sharp edge, high contrast moment down here would just steal the attention away from the more important area. Again, we, we learn from mistakes. I learned that one because it really just killed the painting. And it, that felt so bad that I said, I'm not going to do that again. So I like to embrace all these things. I like to think about the process, uh, the, the just spirit of creativity. And you learn a lot from these little errors, especially if you have somebody with a ton of experience saying, hey, I've been there before. This is how I got through it. So in this case, uh, I've, made, I've made that error a ton of times with that, that table edge. In the small moment, it might look like this really cool moment, but in the overall composition, it can just really steal the show and take you away from where you want the painting to focus on. So by now, in my process, that's just an automatic way of thinking which is how a lot of these principles have to become in order to be really used in the creative effort. So it's just like anatomy. If, if you know your anatomy, you can, the, the way you see is in those, in those anatomy things, you're not going to, you're not going to draw an arm starting with a humerus and then putting, you know, bicep, tricep, uh, deltoid, brachialis, extensor carpi radialis, longest brachio radialis. You're not, you're not going to build it uh, origin determination and um, it, that'd just be a super inefficient way of getting to a finished product. But if it's just the part of the way you see and it's automatic, you're not paralyzed by overthinking about how to pull all that off. Uh, it's just there. It's just part of the way, you know, and when you, when you want to diagnose problems, Almost all those problems get diagnosed from the anatomy level. So it's really great to know those, um, all that information. It's just, it can be a little paralyzing for the painting process itself. It's just a totally different way of thinking. So again, you know, all these little, these quirks that I'm explaining out loud are just kind of normal ways of thinking right now. It's because I've made the mistakes enough and, um, I joke to the students, it's, it's not really even much of a joke. It's just saying, you know, I know to look for these things because I'm standing on a large pile of bad paintings. 
Not even. What's that? I've never seen one. You've never seen a bad painting? Oh, yeah. Yours. It's because they're hidden in a crypt. <laughs> no, I. You know all those early paintings that you were so proud of. They become your bad painting. So even if you are super proud of a painting, as you build skills, they're going to be they're going to be the ones that you look back on and say, "Oh, look how far I've come." You know, so it's not like my early work was bad. Bad. It's just, you know, I'm better now than I was then. That's the way it should work. So I've not I didn't take any consideration to the direction of the brush stroke. I have fairly thinned out paint and I'm putting it just in a slapdash way. Sometimes I really like how that turns out, but none of that is really intentional yet. Um, and the reason is I just don't want to think about style yet. I've explained that already, but um, worth repeating. So, okay. So now this is the edge of, this is the very end of abstract simplification. So I'm gonna start building up that main uh, egg. And it's now in a really good environment. So before there was really nothing to compare it to and that's why it's just as simple as it is. But now I can really see where I'm going. And so that, that's why I go in the order that I do. It goes from the simplest version possible for the focal subject area to you know the blocking of the the secondary objects they might get a little bit more informed because now they have something to compare to i've already kind of worked out what the middle tone of the main subject is so i know what to do with the secondary stuff and then um the environment really really influences um how we see these things so i think it's a mistake to feel like we can uh perfect any one spot because you might be unpleasantly surprised when you get to these other areas and now all of a sudden what you thought was intense doesn't read against that background or um, you just can't have that harmony of the painting. As you get super experienced, maybe the people watching are super experienced and they're, they're just thinking, well, well, I can do that. Like, okay, great. You know, because as you get more adept at painting, then yeah, you, you can see ahead to how things are shaking out and you can be a little bit bolder in the beginning. But I, just as a personal preference, I really like uh, the simplicity. I've learned to love it. So I wouldn't change that even though I have a lot more skill than I had when I started. So also too is, is to take the pressure off. If you don't have to make it look pretty right off the bat, then you're not gonna get so judgmental. You're not going to defeat yourself from saying, oh, this looks bad or this looks good or, you know, even looking good can be a curse too, because then again, you're protecting those areas. But I don't, I don't like to do that. I'm going to paint this egg a little bit farther than I want to go to kill the outline. And then um, I'll paint into those edges. So the system of light, the, the story of the light is going to be that this lamp is bright. So I'm going to have pretty harsh transitions between light and shadow. It's going to have a pretty vibrant reflected lights. Um, maybe a little washed out in the highlights, you know, with brightness, but spark, bright sparkly highlights. It's got a warmth to it. So I'm going to, just cool down the shadows in relationship to the light. And um, the direction is more overhead than I want to go. But again, it's, it's because the camera needs to be in a certain spot. So that's not exactly what I want, but happy to have people watching and participating with me, so it's worth it. So I mentioned before that if I want a bold brush stroke, I limit it my, my paint load to one stroke and then I stop and retool. 
that I wanted to smash together a little bit because I want that reflective light to melt from the turning shadow all the way to the reflective light. And then there's a little bit of an occlusion that we're not going to, we're not going to get reflected light on the very bottom edge of the egg. And the reason is because the reflected light only comes from the brighter areas of the table. It doesn't come from the cast shadow. So I, I want a little flash of deeper red, you know, deeper red gray. Go for two and mixing that. A deeper red gray right on the very bottom and start the reflected light a little bit higher. Just because the, the nature of reflected light has to be coming from a light source. Cast shadow is not a bright light source. All right. So this edge will get justified. I want to look at these relationships. It is darker than the red egg, the brown red egg, mostly brown. Uh, but it's not dark either. It's not nearly as dark as most of the other compositional elements. So that's just, it's just a really tricky value exchange. I do see a bit of warmth in there. It's kind of glowing. The, the egg is translucent. And that light is not only reflecting into it from the bright light sources on the inside, but it also is passing through it a tiny bit. And so I want to capture that, maybe even exaggerate it if it doesn't kill my other values. And so I already kind of know where the parameters of my values are. And I want to go ahead and find that exchange and it's going to help inform me on the other areas. So I don't, I don't feel like I have to get the main egg perfect. I want it to be a good sort of example for the rest of the painting. What I'm going to base my decisions off of, because I also don't want anything to compete with that main egg uh, visually. And that's another thing that I can use is like, this is the upper limit of vibrancy and edge and texture and excitement. And if anything starts to compete with it as I develop the rest of the painting, then that's something I can adjust to fix, you know, to problem solve. And I don't really like the word fix. I don't like the word mistake. I think the only mistake you can make is, you know, maybe going into detail a little too fast. Because then you just lock yourself into things that don't need to be locked in yet. It creates one of three bad problems. One is, you know, you'd have to move this little area that you worked so hard to make and you like so much. So to remove it is, you know, it's heartbreaking. It's, it's not fun. The second is to adjust the entire painting to a tiny little detail spot. And when you do that, it's, highly inefficient. It probably will hurt your composition. Sometimes you can get away with it and the composition aspect, but still highly inefficient to base the entire painting off of the tiny little detail spot. And I, I do appreciate efficiency a lot. It's really important to me because I don't paint nearly enough. Uh, you know, my kids take up a lot of time in all the best ways because they're, you know, awesome. But, um, you know, I teach a lot. I don't want to waste time making inefficient uh, decisions like having to undo and redo detail areas or paint the entire painting on, uh, to suit that tiny little spot. Uh, the third is to leave a glaring mistake. Something looks really bad, it looks inaccurate, it hurts your impression of the painting on the first impression, which is the most important thing. The first impression is by far the most important aspect of your painting. So when you take a break from your painting and walk in and see it for the first time since coming back from like completely separating yourself from the painting, you're bound to see some things that look really either odd. Sometimes you're pleasantly surprised how something looks, uh, but that's kind of a truer look. It's, it's, 
it's not going to get rescued by detail. It's not going to be rescued by uh, cool looking brushwork. Your painting either works on the first impression and people will justify why they liked it as they get closer in or something will seem really off and whatever they when they get closer to the painting to see the brushwork and things like that they're going to look for ways of justifying why they didn't like it and you know i think that's really true uh even a great big painting that gets reduced down for a magazine or something or uh you know a lot of i'd say most uh most contests right now are, you know, online. The first impression is that tiny little thumbnail. And I bet you've clicked through, clicked right by a lot of really well-crafted paintings because they didn't work on the big picture. And, um, That big picture, that overall painting is going to be, you know, really the selling point of the painting. Okay, so I can see by my secondary block in the, the, the color scheme could be a little bit brighter. And, um, yeah, small adjustments because the big picture worked on that simple level to start with just needs to get more refined. I'm going to put that style note in when I'm ready. But right now I'm just building five values. In this case, the, the five values really are a little tricky because that little rim of the egg shell is going to catch a lot of light. So that tiny little detail note represents some of the brighter highlights. And the bright sparkly highlights of the glass, they are kind of a limiting factor. I want them to be really bold. And I could put them in as my brightest light. Um, and that, that's a kind of a cap for what I can do with the egg. If I want the bright spot, if I care about that sort of level of realism, like the the shininess of the egg getting a brighter highlight than a lot of the egg does, like even in the white parts. So I'll I'll create the painting that suits me best, even if it gets a little bit outside of reality. That just makes sense. That the highlight of the glass gets uh, extra bold. All right, um, I don't really like that shape. I'm gonna do something about it. Right. Uh, I'm probably gonna eventually go to pretty thick paint on this. Um, I'm just not ready to do it quite yet, just cause the precision of the side of the egg let's get a little bit of an outline i'm probably going to end up undoing this just because i'm going to do more with the glass and i do not want to paint around this tiny little line but just to see it at first knowing that i might have to undo this it seems like i'm directly contradicting what i just said about uh protecting detail and stuff i'm just saying right now that i know in my head I'm already going to lose this. So a helpful little hint. Create your own rules. <laughs> break, them with, break them for the special situation of the painting. Um, Alright, so have that glow on the inside yet. I don't have to get it exactly right, but I do like this relationship of the, the darker parts of the shell. 
there's a little silhouette in here that I think that would be really great to get right. And I don't want to go any darker for that middle tone to do so. So you saw me keying up the red of the egg, the brown of the egg a little bit brighter. And all that is in hopes of doing this. This little silhouette here, I think, is really nice. Yeah. Cool. So now I can be really bold with the other eggs. I can even go bold with this one, mostly because all the little tentative things that I wasn't a hundred percent sure where they fell in the value range are getting clarified. So I'm going to go richer with uh, some of these turning values. create a little bit of an exchange here. I'm going to punch that highlight back out and rather than paint around it. I like my highlights to be really thick. So instead of painting around highlights, I just blast right through them and put them right back in with an impasto. That just means thick paint. This is not one of my brighter areas. doesn't quite get to the highlight. It's close, but it doesn't quite get there. Not like some of the other eggs. All right. So. Developing a feel can be a little hard. I mentioned for a while uh, that talking about the nature of brush strokes, if I want to have a brush stroke just sit on the top of wet paint, I'll relegate it to just a single brush stroke. But you can saw all the mixing I was doing on the canvas itself, or not canvas, but panel. That was. Um, That was intended to mix together. I just knew those colors are safe. It's just going to go in a simple arc from a deeper red or mid-tone to a brighter yellow or highlight. And I can smash them together a little bit. Eggs, egg, you can get away with uh, a nice textured painting, but I feel like it captures eggs a little bit more if you create um, a little bit of softness, a little smoothness. All right, so now we're getting there. A lot of times I'll go bolder than this, but I, I emphasize a lot that this is not the stage to rush. If you don't really like what you're doing, go no further because If this network of values is pretty close to what you want, then the next round of detail goes on in a smaller shape, value, and color. So the decision making is already there. Like you're not going to, if you scrutinize these early stages, you're really not going to make poor decisions on the detail phase. The poor decision on the detail phase happened because you didn't spend long enough refining this simple phase. And a lot of times that goes a lot faster for me than this, but I didn't make, you know, I'm still making some decisions and, uh, this is the stage to take your time. So if you watch, uh, YouTube for last night's figure drawing or figure painting, uh, it was, uh, on plexiglass. So there, there was a big time cap for how thick a paint I could go 
it was just slipping and sliding everywhere. I couldn't, I couldn't put any, I don't know, like graceful layering on there. And I was like, oh, all right, I figured out my system and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hack away. So instead of my typical way, I uh, resorted to more blending. And so just having all these uh, little skill sets, yeah, you might end up painting a little bit differently than you're accustomed to, but you have the tools to figure out how to problem solve and change the situation. So I'm not gonna say painting on plexiglass is easy, but it was only a problem solver way of getting to the fundamentals that I like. The painting was cool though, because uh, I kept switching the background. I probably spent an hour um, just switching the backgrounds because that was so fun. <laughs> you were there, Liz. I was. I was down like giddy about, I'm like, oh, what about this background? What about this background? What about this background? <laughs> I like the lace. The lace was cool. I liked it when um, when I was folding the uh, the fabric to look like she was sitting on like a shelf. I wish we had the full time with her though. Like she came in half hour late and left on time. I know you asked. But you did the right thing. It was just, uh, you know, I also feel bad that she had that car accident, but you know, we, we kind of got shortchanged a little bit. All well and good. That's another reason I forgot. Sometimes I forget that last night was a real late night too. That's why I'm so tired. <laughs> All right. So uh, I kind of like what I'm doing. There's some things that I still want to adjust in this main egg. I just really feel like. I've been dwelling in this area for so long that it'd be nice to get a fresh eye. So I'm just going to move on to another spot and revisit it when I'm ready. So that's a little bit of a compromise. I wanted to, to really have this as the anchor for the rest of the painting. It's just not, it's just not doing what I want yet. But if I keep packing away, I'm just going to get frustrated. So I'm going to get the other eggs blocked in and, um, I'll revisit this from a place of fresh eye and clarity. So hopefully that makes sense. I uh, I say a lot, but although I have a formula, maybe a protocol that I like to follow, I'm not beholden to it. I'm creating the painting that I want from, you know, adaptation and just a lot of different a lot of different ways of making the marks that I want to make. And in this case, just, just getting a visual break, just cutting to a different area of the painting is going to really help, I think. So, painted eggs many times, so I'm surprised this is going to make a fuss, but I'm pretty confident by the end of the painting I'll have something that I like. Really like that exchange. So we're going to do something about it. Just got a little bit outside of its bounds. There.
It's going better. Think about a way of getting the still life uh, itself more readable. Because the camera's too far away, it's really hard to see the painting itself. So I'd rather the painting be really visible than uh, the subject. But Oh, you know what I forgot, Liz? I told you I was going to um, send you that photo. So we'll take a break. We'll take a break in a little while. Put the photo up in the chat, or at least the link to it. Because we're not going to spend a whole lot of time figuring out how to make it present just right. But Yeah, it's getting there. I mean, I, I, what, what I need to do is, is keep bouncing around and just uh, see just the overall shapes. And then, then I'm going to revisit this. And I know kind of where I'm going to go with this is uh, I want this, this glow off of this little egg to be really bright and vibrant in here. I'm just going to fall barely short of this. And so when that happens, I feel like it's going to have a drama to it. I'm going to brighten up most of the table. Uh, I, I, pre, I darkened it more than I thought I was going to go in order to get the reflections, but I think I'll get the reflections to read with a dark over the brighter table. It's just going to make the eggs uh, feel more, uh, you know, just more contrast. And so here I am fussing with the very egg that I said I wasn't going to fuss with. And, uh, I mean, it looks so perfect to me. Perfect to you. I mean, it's coming along. It, I'll feel happier when the rest of the painting supports it. Like I said, it, it's nothing in isolation. So, I mean, if you have this perfect egg in a sort of blobby environment, you're not going to enjoy that perfect egg as much. And I'm, not, I'm definitely not calling this a perfect egg. <laughs> that arrogant so-and-so. But uh, what I really like it about uh, eggs is that little translucency, and uh, it just makes these reflected lights bright and vibrant. Like, you can tell that that table is not bright and, uh, you know, it's not reddish. That glow is coming from the translucency of the egg. If you hold an egg up to the light, They'll have that glow, and that's that's what's making these uh, reflected lights so vibrant. They just have to feel like they're part of the shadow value still, even with the light passing through. It's just not. It's, it's really um, it's not bright. It's just vibrant compared to the environment that's in, and that environment is uh, you know those dark gray shadows. All right, so now that's yeah, that, that's a little bit better. But I haven't, I haven't yet come in with my really fine brushes and, and refined anything. So the last two paintings were 
really loose brushwork. I might have I might have this one a little loose, uh, a little bit tighter than the other ones, just just because the the nature of the eggs. But it, we'll see what happens with the backgrounds. So I'm still still making decisions. Damn, update again. I have I did an adjustment to where last week I was I lost. YouTube to uh, that Instagram stole the camera and the screen went black on YouTube. So this time I have it plugged into the lap the desktop. But every time every like I don't know 20 minutes it wants to do an update for Adobe. And so that's what I'm seeing on the screen right now is the, do you want to update Adobe? But I've tried to click on that in the past and it did nothing. So it's just this kind of plague of my existence. I can't really get rid of it and I can't, you know, satisfy what it's trying to do. It just still, it just, that's all I see right now. It, it kind of took away the, the screen that I was reading YouTube one. So, all right. Um, I'm still not happy with the vibrancy of that egg. And you were saying it looks perfect. I do appreciate that. I, I take your statements as honest and yeah, it I appreciate so it. I know. It's just, I don't know. That's, I know I'm really confident I'm going to get it to where I want it to be. And I know I'll get there better by stop fussing with it and work on other areas. So I better do that instead of just talking about it. <laughs> That's the nature for everybody, though. We're, we're always going to get frustrated in little moments of the pain. Just can't let it drag you down. What I see from here with your the end you're working on right now, mm -hmm. Michelle, and the other the one that's right next to it, there's some negative space, right? Little tiny negative space. Yeah. That's yeah. really nice. I like that. Yeah, I wanted to preserve. I can see it from here. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to preserve that. I'm glad it's reading that well. Subtle, but I can still read it. I'm gonna do a lot of little tiny edge work on these when I figure out the scheme. Like the scheme isn't quite there yet. And a lot of times I get there a lot faster. This one, again, it's just, you know, it's falling just a little bit short of what I want. And that's good to see. It's not great for demonstration, but it's, you know, I get a lot of insight out of when these demonstrations that I watch have the struggle moments that they have to work through because that, that's honestly what you have to do on paintings. It's, you have to do a lot of problem solving. And it's not, and we're not talking about, I mean, I don't think bad. I'll let everybody else be the judge of that, but I, I'm not thinking about that. I'm just thinking about it's not as dramatic as I like at this stage. This stage, I want to be scaling back the sort of garishness, and I'm not. I'm just not there yet. I like I like a lot of exaggeration early on, and this is not. It's just kind of falling short. It's like uh, in a gesture drawing, if you don't push the difference between rib cage and pelvis, it's like the the pose is accurate-ish, but it's a little stiff, a little boring. That's that's kind of what I'm reacting to right now. And it sounds like I'm belly aching. I, I can totally understand if anybody does think that. <laughs> it feels like it to me. But we'll get there. Keep moving forward.
Yeah, last night went well. I don't think everybody paid me, though. I need to pay better attention to that. Yeah, we had, I tried to get them to pay you. Because we had, like, what, 14? Yeah, we had more like 18 to 20. Are you serious? Yeah. I would say 18, but maybe, maybe more than that. You think more than 18? I mean, I'm saying it as a surprise, not not questioning you. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to figure it out right now. All right, so we yeah. had... Yeah, I'll let you know in a minute. Let me just think about it. Watched the demo. Uh, who was it? I've watched total wipeouts on on demonstrations. That's not going to happen on this. I'm going to dig this one up. I don't see what's wrong with it, really. I mean, you know, I can do do what I can. I mean, well, to me yeah, like I said, it's not that it's bad. It's just that it's blocked. And I, I like this stage to be really rich. So it's getting there. I have a I have a nice bold highlight right here. Put that in. That's gonna add some drama. I think that's kind of a dead color, so I'm gonna spruce that up too. Create that little bit of glow. So that helps. Egg is growing on me too. Better watch out for that. Super bold reflection right here. The uh, the egg and the little cracked shell in front of it is bouncing a ton of light into this. Or I can't put it as bright as the midtone light. And if I go any brighter with the midtone light, then I will have sort of violated the bounds of the story of the light. If this egg isn't super shiny, it's not supported by those super bold highlights of like a polished metal or something. So I really don't want this reflected light to be brighter than this, but I don't want to go much brighter than that for the sake of losing color and the sake of uh, the brighter elements. Just a little bit of a juggling act. I'm going to get it balanced through just this little pushing, pushing and pulling. Yeah, I just, I just don't like the color yet. I want to get it bold. So you're hearing me sweat my way through this. And all the other ones went really confidently. Even, even the uh, holly on the metallic ground, yeah. that went in really smoothly. And that was, that was a bit tricky to get anything to stick to that slick surface. I've done a lot of eggs. This should, this, I don't know. Anytime you put a, it should this or that, it's going to do the opposite. So, okay, now we're cooking. All right. So then, by the end, when I get those little lines in there, it's gonna, it's gonna do it. All right. So I'm gonna get pretty bright right here. I don't see a highlight, but I have. There's a lot of potential for it to be there. As long as the viewer believes it, I'm good. All right, cool. Moving forward. Like I said, 
said with my mass conception, I did the little bit of the skinny version of these eggs. I just have to be conscious that they are growing. I don't want them to grow outside of the bounds. And then I'll see what style notes that I need to make. I already know that it's a little, it's falling a little bit short of the drama that I usually like at this stage. So I'm probably going to add some brushwork to it. That'll make it more exciting. The edges will really help. And that was the reason that I stayed a little bit on the thin side of paint to start with. So I wouldn't be fighting all that thick paint as I'm trying to add fine detail. Right. Okay, good. All right, so look at that cracky egg and uh, cracky, craggy surface in just a second. I'm gonna get some brushwork on the glass. I'm gonna get that nice and bold. I'm gonna readjust the background and foreground, and then I'm really gonna attack this thing with, the, with those real little fine edges. With the glass, I want I want to do less than I see. I'd rather do less than do too much. So if I put in too little. I can always just add more, but every new thing that I add, I want to be conscious of stopping and seeing what it looks like when I swim. Even better to be, would be to take a break and come back. Using a hand mirror would be nice, especially for symmetrical things like glass. Um, it will really expose if there's an asymmetry that's, that's throwing off what perceives as the accuracy of it. If you put it in a mirror, of course, if you put it on your shoulder, it'll reverse it horizontally, that's really good. But you also put it up into your forehead and look up, and it'll flip it upside down. So that's even better than flipping the painting upside down because you can compare it to the subject and the um, painting upside down simultaneously. I can't flip this setup upside down because I'm working from life. I could do it in Photoshop or, you know, I could do it pretty easily on a photograph, but I'm not working from the photo. So the, um, flipping the mirror, uh, putting the mirror into your forehead and looking up flips it vertically on both, both the subject and the painting itself. That, that'll really tell you if your symmetry is off. Say that again? Uh, just looking at a hand mirror. Oh, okay. If you look at a hand mirror uh, over your shoulder and look, you know, look, look behind you into the mirror uh, screen, uh, glass, then it will flip everything horizontally. So everything on the here will be on the other side. On the left will be on the right. If you put the mirror into your forehead and look up, it'll flip everything upside down. And that's a really great, you know, different way to see it. And it'll super, it'll really expose symmetrical problems. Like if, uh, if the halves don't work together, then yeah. it won't, it won't be subtle about telling you that you're wrong. <laughs> it, it will downright be insulting. Okay, that was way too bright. Yikes. Not a terribly precise painter. Not that I don't you know, take my time or anything. It's just putting the brush in exactly the right space. I, I know artists that do that a lot better. So the way I get around it is I'll paint something a little, maybe a little bit too far, a little bit too thick, and then I'll scale it back with the environmental information. 
really works well for um, oil painting. Doesn't work so great for like pen and ink. I gotta be a lot more careful with pen and ink, watercolors, things like that. But with oils, I know that I can just work wet into wet and, uh, you know, just take a, an edge that isn't quite right and make it better. Yeah, the second line that you have on the glass, uh -huh. for me, and it could be just the angle of the camera, it looks like the left side is wider than the right side. That's good enough. Um, the, I mean, but it, it could be that I'm looking at a funny angle. I think a lot of times when I'm editing the video, it looks like that. And in the real painting, it doesn't as much. But okay. but I want to take what you're saying seriously. Yeah, on the screen, this looks this painting looks pretty. <laughs> I don't know, it looks pretty good. I see what you're saying because now I just got rid of that update on the screen on YouTube. And I think I think you're right. It is um, looking skewed more skewed in the uh, screen than on the real painting. But what I want to fall short of saying is, no, it's right. Uh, I want to really take what you're saying seriously and um, and consider that. And it's going to be based on the center line. So if the center line is right about here, then I haven't really defined this edge all that much, but it's measuring pretty well. And so I'll... Yeah, that, part, that part looks okay. I'm talking about like the second... Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's only that all that has right now is just the darks. So I don't have the drawings for the light yet. Like I, I don't want to I don't want to say oh no I'm getting to that or whatever. That's such a lame thing to say, but. Um, well, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking maybe it's just the angle that I'm looking at. Yeah, I am conscious of it, but let's let's go ahead. And, it's time for that anyway. So let's let's just see what it looks like after I get. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. No, no. I I like the feedback. And I'm not trying to be defensive. I'm just saying it's missing a lot of major elements so far. Like I only use the uh, darks as a placeholder because I, I moved them around a lot. I didn't really like uh, how almost perfectly in thirds this um, water line made the glass. And I, I made a little bit of a mistake there. Instead of just trying to make it up, it would have been so much better just to drink a little bit of water or throw, dump some of it out, you know, to change the composition to what I want instead of trying to make it up a little bit. So I would say, yeah, so I'm just going to go ahead and say that that's a mistake. Like that's an easy composition adjustment to make it that I can observe something I like better rather than trying to change it on the painting. It's not like I'm going to, it's not going to stop me from pulling it off. I, you know, I don't think that's that big of a deal. But um, if I can make a little adjustment to the composition to make it ideally what I want, that's so much better. I really like what you're doing now. You do? Yeah. You're gonna, I think you're going to love it when I change the foreground. I think that's part of the reason I'm just a little, I don't know, feeling like it's a little blah. It really looks like water in a glass. I mean, it's so... Oh, okay. You're talking about just the glass itself. Yeah, I think that's going well. I mean, it looks like it looks like a water. I mean, it looks like water in the glass. I need to. It really looks good. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, I like it too when you bring the paintings in so that I can see them. Oh uh, yeah. Well, they. And no matter what you do, it's going to look different in uh, cameras and um, even like print and, and magazines and stuff like that. It's never going to look like the real thing. Right. I get super. I like to see the real paintings, you know? Yeah, I get I get really frustrated in my photography of artwork because you know you work so hard to make it what you want in the real painting itself. And that little bit of distortion, like there's a tiny bit of glare here, or the colors are a little off there, like that's that's super frustrating. And I know I know artists that really do a tremendous job photographing their artwork, and I just don't know how they do it because I've 
I've done the I've done the magazine. I've done uh, the articles and stuff, the YouTube videos, how to get a really good setup, how to get the lighting just right, and how to you know take the angle, bounce light off the phone core, uh, look straight down on it, and take the shot. I, all my paintings just grab so every bit of glare in the room, and um, it's not like they're super shiny. Like I know people's work that's a lot shinier than mine. I just don't understand what's going wrong with that. Um, maybe it's just I'm being too picky, but um, yeah, just what you're saying is like I, I think it makes a big difference seeing it in person. So we have our little show at St. John's tomorrow. Oh, really? That's great. I'm going to drag the kids out there. What time? What time is it? Um, I think we're going to start at like 9 and go till 1. So are they having a service then? Yeah, and that's that's the, going to be the bulk of the people who show up. Um, okay. So, I mean, I could do a better job advertising it and getting getting more people out there. I'm a little hesitant to uh, to do that though because, like, I really want the Schuler show to be really well attended. I don't want people to get burned out on art shows. Right, right. No, I mean, I really think it's nice that they're showing the congregation. You know, it's great. They're doing such nice work. Yeah. That's what I saw. I really like. Oh, my students! Yeah, they're they're tremendous. Yeah. And they, they all have a, they have a nice mix of personalities. Like you know, Shirley wants her work to be a little bit more abstract, and I'm I'm happy to work with her on that level. Sandra, is, yeah, and uh, Sa Sandra uh, De Rossi likes her you know rather rendered uh, still lives, and they look great. You know, she did a Bugro copy I think when you were there. Oh uh, yeah, right. And. Um, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. God, she's good. Uh, Marsha does a lot of uh, like dogs and hunt scenes and stuff. Yeah, so it's a pretty wide mix of uh, genres and styles and media. Because we have like what? Marsha. Marsha, she would have been online. It's uh, tragic though because like she'd been saying all year that uh, she's going to come in person, and uh, you know it just doesn't work out for. Her. Uh, schedule or whatever, and um, I went to I went to class, all well and good. You know, people were filtering in, and I get a call saying I've got to pick up my kid because he was like falling asleep in class and feeling poorly. And so the few people that were there, I was just like, look, I'm going to take off. I'm going to. Um, I'm going to be on Zoom. Like, just bear with me while I, I'll give you a round of instruction and bear with me as I get out to, you know, Westminster and pick up the kid. And, um, and then I'll, in the parking lot, I'll, I'll Zoom in, give you another critique, and then get home and then give you another critique. So, so the teachers were all like, yeah, yeah, he really, uh, he's really feeling poorly and, and laying down. And he's asleep in the office, all this stuff. And like, it's not like I don't believe him or anything. It's just after I got him home and at least even part of the car ride, it was like chatterbug and super active. It's like, you're not feeling poorly, <laughs> but, but that was like the one time Marsha showed up like all year, like she was able to make it. And I contacted all the people who might be showing up late and she just wasn't on my radar for that. And so she showed up in person and was like, oh, man, come on. <laughs> well, I, it'll be a good story, I guess. Yeah, no, she took it in stride. She's really cool about it. I mean, really laid back, nice person. Um, but it was just so ironic. It's like the one time she could make it, she showed up just late enough to miss me as I left. I left maybe a half hour after class started. And then... Um, yeah, and it's just, just the way it goes, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, uh, class is nice. 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, see if they want to display in our show, and I'm going to um, try to get the work there uh, to Schuler School in the morning uh, on Monday. Oh, that would be perfect. So. Because that's where I have my duck. I have my duck there at uh, St. John's. Oh, nice. And I have uh, a couple of those newer Ala Primas. And I have that, that little terrier scratch board. Yeah. You know, the, the scratch board of that man, I know you, you did it a while back, but that is so nice. Of Irv Horseman? Yeah, it's so beautiful. Thank you. I mean, I have it at my station, but, you know, of course, you, you can move it. I just put it there to get it out of the way so it wouldn't get damaged. Yeah. With, well. with the stuff, but it, it really is so beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's really, really nice. Yeah, I did that uh, all prima. In summer school, I don't know how many years ago that was. That was a long time ago. Were you a student? No. Okay. I mean, I've been teaching there for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I, I think my, I think my grandmother was still alive. I think so. It must have been maybe oh nine or something. Wow. At least oh nine, because that's that's the year she died. That's some mistaken it was 08. Got married in 08, and then six months later, her mom died. And I don't think it was terribly long after that, then my grandmother died. Yeah, that's a lot of loss. It, it was a lot. It was a lot of loss in one year. Yeah. And we had cats that died in the same year. It was just a lot of, it was a lot that year. Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's life. It's got to go through those things. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Now the glass is coming together. And I'm going to get these nice reflections of the eggs into the glass. Probably still looks crooked for you because I, I can see it on the screen and it does look a little skewed. Actually, no. So I think, well, I don't think it'll look as skewed if uh, just maybe later I'll take a break and I'll put um, put the camera square to the painting or just even lift up the painting and that'll that'll definitely help. Yeah, I mean it, it's okay. You know, it just sometimes um, even when I take pictures of my own stuff, it's, you know, it's crooked. I'm, I'm my, you know, I'm taking the picture crooked. Well, but they. Uh, the camera has to be at an angle because I have to put my hand in front of it. Yeah, no, no, I'm not complaining. I, I just wasn't sure what I would see. Uh, okay, yeah, I, I hope I'm, it's not saying that I'm saying that you're complaining. What I'm saying is that I was taking what you were saying seriously that, you know, you said it was skewed and I wanted to really... Uh, well, I just, yeah, I wondered and I thought it was probably just the way I'm looking at it. Plus, I'm also looking at a at a wall in my room that is, um, is angled. That's, I'm using a projector. Okay. So I'm projecting on a wall. And the wall is not, up in, it's not a straight wall. Okay, so, so my camera is skewed to the painting and your, your I'm image is skewed to the wall. Right. So you're like double skewed. <laughs> I got, I got issues. <laughs> yeah, so you said it, not me. <laughs> I said it. I, I'm owning it. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if you could see the difference. Steven, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Marianne, I wasn't counting because we don't. I wish we could pay the models more, and I just said, look, you know, I, we won't count you. I won't take your money. So don't count her. I mean, obviously, you would if you didn't know that, but um, yeah, don't count her. Um, yeah. I mean, if he doesn't pay, that's fine too. Um, just because he does a lot. Yes, we have Bertina. Let's talk to getting someone. What do you think? Uh, okay. Alright, so let, let's. Uh, did you include. Uh, I don't think of who, where people sat. Um, did you include John Cremines? Yeah, he's number 13. Um, he's, did you, he's the guy that was student there before, right? Yeah, he was He was in a class before me. Yeah, he said he wants to come full time. Love that, Matt. Yeah, that's what he told your mom. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. I thought he did graduate. I mean, he, he, always, he told me that his graduating class at, was the first one, no, that John Cello. Taught. So he taught the first year that, I mean, he, he graduated the year that John Petullo taught his first class, I guess. That's interesting. Yeah, and he said there were like 26 people who graduated. I'm like, what? Wow. Uh, I don't think the graduation class was that big, but the, it was it was crazy. It was hard to find spots. Uh, we had to yeah. really manage it really quite well. And like I said, I took I took really terrible places. I I painted standing on the trapdoor, like on top of a stool, uh, for portrait class. I painted still lives and on in the room with the piano, the dining room or living room. I mean, really? Yeah, because I just didn't want to take uh, like the prominent spots from people. Um, it was crazy. So Jamie Eichelberger was uh, in the uh, li uh, dining room, and I was in the living room. Wow. I Man, I didn't mind it. I I kind of like my like darker light than most people like anyway. Yeah, you did say that. So. Yeah, I didn't really care. Um, but yeah, it was mob. You know, I I think honestly it was too many people, but I guess that's better than not enough. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. All right, so now this glass is missing just a few little things. Some few accents would be nice. And then uh, getting those reflections of the eggs in there. And then, like I said, I want to really solidify the background and foreground because they need to be adjusted because they're kind of muting things. I like seeing the uh, background through the glass. I mean, that, that's kind of a requisite for glass. Um, it's just not elevating the other props enough. So I'm going to try to keep it so that the, the glass still works, but I can still tweak the background. There's going to be a little tiny range that I can get away with and still check those boxes. And so um, I can't go any brighter than this. That's pure white. So I'm not going to do that. And um, I can get away with the splashes of color for the eggs reflecting into the glass. That will make it a little bit better. And then this edge, the edge, I, I just don't want to over define the edge. I don't want it to be outlined. Right. But I feel like if I find it here, I can lose it here. 
and then it won't be solidly outlined. And then with that line here, I see the uh, egg a little further in, but I don't have to put it there. Because again, my the, the standard that I need is to make it believable for the viewer. And I'm pretty sure the viewer wouldn't balk at me putting the highlight or the reflective light closer to the edge. Pretty sure. We'll see. And sometimes it's nice to see it rather than just theorize, but um, pretty sure I'm going to get away with that. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. We'll put the eggs right here on the edge so I don't have to have that dark outline defining the whole thing, the whole edge. And maybe I can go a tiny bit brighter than that, but not much. If this is reflecting, this has to be duller. I mean, by definition. So, so if I put that there, maybe I can even get away with just a little thin line of red right here, too. That's nice. There we go. There's a reflection there. I can even have it going over this brown. That didn't work. That worked. All right, so then we can still feel that dark going through, but it's not solid and heavy. And then I can put the egg. Let's go even brighter than that. So now it's not a solid dark line. I broke it up with this reflection here. The reflection there, even though it's not exactly accurate to what I'm seeing, I feel like it's believable. So that's artistic license in a nutshell. I'm not painting verbatim what I see. I'm making artistic decisions. And uh, now I'm going to hit the background before and then I'm really going to make these dramatic because there's I'm just not feeling it yet. I think I made that super clear, but everyone else, or you're telling me it's fine, but <laughs> just not, it's just not there yet. I'm not, I'm not feeling it quite yet. In fact, I'm going to grab some black oil and really spread it out and get something maybe a little bit more texture to read against the um, relatively smoother eggs. And maybe that's part of the problem I have. It's just everything smooth, 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 smooth. And um, if I got a little bit of a rougher idea here in the background, that might do the trick. And I did go brighter for that inside of the egg because I was a little tentative about that, but I know I can get away with it now because I have more uh, areas of, of almost pure white to read it against and just understand where my range is. These edges are going to get excited because they're real craggy edges and um, just wasn't ready for that because I just don't like the big, I didn't like the big picture yet. So by now on all those other all primas, I didn't really struggle that much to get to this point. I think that's that's good to hear though, because again, it's not like every painting is going to go perfectly to plan. And sometimes you paint better, and some days you paint worse, and some days you feel like you're painting bad even if you're not. <laughs> And some days you can feel like you're doing, you can do no wrong, and it's really not going as well as you think. So there's everything in between. And this time I just wasn't feeling it. But now I'm starting to see some of the potentials. And if it sounds like complaining, sorry, if it sounds like um, you know, just kind of that inner dialogue that a lot of demo artists won't let you have access to. I, I hope that helps because that thought is there. I, I, I attended a Jacob Collins demo as tremendous as he is. He was not feeling that painting. He did not like how it started and he was sweating for a lot of the painting. And uh, that was really informative for me. I, I think he's a tremendous artist. So if I had made this edge perfect, I would have lost it or had a super, be super precise. And I don't want to be super precise. All right. Glasses in. 
Maybe it needs a tweak later. We'll see. Uh, the foreground, I want to go brighter. I don't want it to be particularly colorful because of the, uh, the eggs and the reflections. But I feel like the eggs will be a lot richer if this gets brighter. Uh, I forgot to block in that egg. Yeah, whatever. I'll go there pretty soon. And again, it's not necessary, it's not really that thick paint, but it is a little choppier than the egg. So just by contrast, if the if the background and foreground are choppier than the foreground, then the eggs look smoother, just by comparison. And then let's just go ahead and throw. Let's just go ahead and throw some egg into the table, maybe even a little bit brighter than that. Wow, that's so cool. Better. Wow, you're our master. I appreciate that. All right, so now I'm feeling the painting a lot better. And that's eventually going to have some light. I don't actually see those reflections, maybe a little hint of them, but. Um, just potential to be there. Let me get some darks in there. All right, so now we're cooking. Maybe I'll tweak those shapes just a little bit more later, but I have a visual feel to where I'm going. Now it's time to get those eggs right. I need more umber. I'll just make an umber. Whoa, that's dark. Yikes. All right, cool. So, um, all right, time to make the eggs exciting. The only thing I'm doing right now is that I just felt like the, um, the reflections would read better if it was darker than it is, but lighter than it was. So it's still doing the, the checking that box of creating contrast for the uh, focal point, but you know, this extra little element wasn't, wasn't reading super strong. So, all right. Good to go. All right. Um, this is the most undefined area. I'm going to hit that first. And then I'm going to get this main egg. And if these get played down to make this elevated, so be it. This is the blocking that didn't happen before. I just neglected this egg. It wasn't on purpose. What do you mean a little bit of a shell? Yeah, I just forgot it. Uh, no, this was uh, part of the kids' breakfast. <laughs> I actually uh, didn't even have to do this. I have a, a whole collection of eggs that 
I used to go to this local farm whose eggs produced all kinds of eggs. It was like green and brown and white and cream. And the, you know, I just, we just get this incredible variety of colors and values and sheens and sizes. It was really great. They yeah, you can get that kind of stuff at the Clark Farm. You can? Yeah, I mean, yeah. And it's really fun. It costs a lot of money, though, but it's a really fun egg. Well, you know, that, that woman, uh, Liz Noddle, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think she's like in charge of all that. So you're saying I could get a discount? I probably could. I know Liz really well. <laughs> I, I know you do. So, yeah, I'm sure they would love to see you even. She used to have a little oil shop on, uh, I guess it's still Baltimore, um, right near where, do you remember where uh, Mitchell School used to be, or was that before you were around here? That was before I was around, but I think Fritz showed me where it was. The oil shop? Well, no, the Mitchell School. Okay. Do you know where uh, the little restaurant Earthwood Fire is? Is it on St. Paul? Uh, I think it's on Mitchell Street. What street is that? Um, no, I don't think it's on Falls Road. Right. Yeah, Falls Road. Is that what her shop was? Yeah. She's a very creative person. Yeah, very. Didn't she do the flowers for your wedding? Sure did. It was like they were spectacular. She said it was like nine thousand. It was like a nine thousand dollar service. <laughs> I, uh, I helped her every once in a while. Um, she, she would provide flowers for like big events, like, uh, you know, or mitzvahs and conferences and stuff like that. And I didn't do anything with the arrangements, I, but I, you know, I might help by serving or, um, you know, just lifting things out of trucks and stuff like that. Not, not too many times. It was, you know, every once in a while. And then, um, yeah, she did. She did our wedding. It was really an amazing arrangement. And um, yeah, we couldn't afford that. <laughs> it's good to know people. <laughs> it is. It really is good to know people. Um, you know, that's something that I definitely wouldn't want the responsibility because you know it's such an important part of the experience. What the flowers? Fresh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but she had a whole she had a whole dedicated business to it. I mean, they had all the setup and the you know the farmers and all that stuff. I guess you call them farmers if they're making the. Yeah. But yeah, but you still have to. Um, yeah, it's still daunting to me because it's not something you can really do ahead of time. Because they have to be fresh. No, she couldn't do them ahead of time. You're right. Yeah, you know, so uh, it's a lot of pressure. To me, I mean, to me, I don't think I could handle that pressure. Yeah. So, um, I think that's pretty cool that they were so spectacular. And they were. You know what else we did? Did I tell you? Oh, yeah, your mother told me that you guys. And the shell girl, is that right? Yeah, the shell girl on the top, on the centerpiece of every table. Was uh, she um, chocolate? It was chocolate and duck fat. Could you eat it? No. Well, you you could, but you wouldn't want to. All right. So, would those things still be around today? You think? I think they kept the. Um, they kept the. Ariadne, the Ariadne ones. 
the the ones for we I think we did have a couple of the showgirls. I don't know it. I would have to see that. If you have pictures, I'd like to see that. Well, we have the mold of the shell girl. We we already had that um, because uh, you probably wouldn't have met her, but Dolly Dunsmore is a graduate yeah. from the Schuler School. Uh, her son was is a sculptor uh, hailing from the Pennsylvania Academy. And um, he came by with a friend, and we made molds of a lot of the Schuler pieces. Wow. Yeah, it was cool. That's and so we used those molds to make the, you know, to put the tallow and, and chocolate faux bronze centerpieces. Do you have any pictures? You probably do, right? Yeah. It was really neat. Yeah. So it was like having, you know, that family legacy there. Yeah. That's really special. It was a really nice one. All right. You see, I went through that highlight again. Oh, yeah. The highlight that I really don't see that has the potential for being right here. And the reason for it is because, again, I just don't like painting around little tiny areas like that if I don't have to. And with highlights, you never have to. Just plop them right back on top. They can be a lot thicker than the rest of the painting. You're not going to risk anything. So just, I don't know, it's one of those just go for it type things. And um, I'm going to bring this grayer value a little higher in. Get that really super soft edge. Sometimes I go against the form, sometimes I go with it. Depends on what the previous brush stroke was. And now I'm going to come in with a fine brush and practically outline the edges and make them really, you know, sharp, really um, jagged. It's part of what I like about eggs. You know, super, super smooth transitions because they're so round and, you know, rather elegant. Um, and then those craggy shards of the edges. Really nice. All right, now we're getting there. But I just made that reflected light really a lot brighter without actually making it brighter. And I feel like I can get away with just a little bit more. Okay. You know what? That highlight really works. Yeah, it's not there. It just has potential. Plus, I like the other highlight over on the other end. That is there. <laughs> it's just, if that gets such a prominent highlight, I feel like it's better to have a one here. That was part of the inspiration for doing it. The other thing is just, I just felt like it was lacking. It just didn't have that, I don't know. Didn't have that glow that I'm going for. In fact, I think I keep oscillating between going pink for the sort of refracted glow on the inside of the egg and gray, which would juxtapose against the warmth of the outside shell. And it's about it's a balancing uh, trick because it's not it's not high contrast. Yet we're trying to say light and shadow. It's just we're not saying one to one. It's not it's not necessarily true that the shadow on the inside of the white egg is going to be uh, darker than the 
light of the relatively darker inside uh, outside of the egg. So I just want that glow in there. It's not a whole lot of contrast, but if I push it a little grayer or darker, then at least the red will read as a color temperature pop. And then again, I don't have to be verbatim. So if I, if I feel like it just needs to be darker, I'll make it darker. If I feel like it needs to be lighter, I'll make it dark, uh, lighter. And then if I don't like it, I'll just go right back. It's not that big of a deal. What is a big deal is getting the painting that I want. And I'm just, you know, sometimes I get there a lot faster. Sometimes you know, usually I get there a lot faster and you win some and you lose some and you sometimes have to problem solve more than usual and that's, that's perfectly fine. It just can be a little frustrating and I was frustrating it, frustrated at first. I'm a little bit more into it now that the glass got in and I like that. So that was a totally right decision to stop hacking away at this area that I wasn't feeling and just develop more of the unfinished painting. Even though I wanted to develop everything in reaction to this main part, it's still worth it to just take a mental break. I don't like that shape. I'm gonna change the shape. This will get better. Now we're starting to get some drama in here. I'm not really copying anymore. Um, some of this is just a little bit made up. You just have to, it has to feel believable that the pieces fit together. But you can get a lot away with a lot. Uh, with changing the shape ever so slightly. Anytime I felt like a shape was too unbroken, I want to break it up. Just like a big scoop of the neck in a, you know, a portrait model. You know, you, anything unbroken for too long, just look for, look closely for it, you'll find it. But even if you don't find it, just make it up. Just do something to say, okay, this is too perfectly circular, or this is too straight of a line. In this case, a lot of it's just being made up. I just felt like that was too perfect, too clean of a break. And I wanted to make it a little bit more interesting. And I think I am going to create more glow in here. Yeah, that would be nice. All right, so it's, it's, oh man, what was that? I grabbed a rogue piece of paint on my palette.
So you can see me taking a lot of brush strokes, and that's usually the opposite way that I like to do it. In this case, I want it to be really smooth transitions, except for the edges. So that's another form of contrast. Uh, if I make that extra smooth, then um, then the craggy parts will seem extra craggy. Alright, so let's come in one. Now I like to step back. It's getting dramatic. Like that's super flat. That's getting rounder. I like the highlight. I agree with it. This is the section of the painting where I stop breathing. <laughs> it's just kind of automatic with details. I guess it's kind of an attempt to not shake with each breath, but I don't do it on purpose. I just find myself like, like oh man, I got to breathe. So anything that doesn't show up on an eggshell, you can do a little bit of a cheat. If you give it a tiny bit of an outline, it's always believable. So it can either be a dark outline or a light outline, but it gives it that razor hard edge and high contrast. And it's just, you know, even if you don't see it, you'll get away with it. And so right there, I didn't feel like that showed up. And on top of that, I can create more contrast with just going a little bit brighter in here. I'll create that really hard edge and these little negative spaces will get stronger because this got brighter. There's a little bit of loss and found to the, the, brown, the red brown of the outside of the egg. And that's okay. It's okay for it to be a little lost right here and then found again down there. That's good. Get these transitions extra smooth. I had to make a creative choice. Like, do I make the brushwork exciting for the egg or do I make it smooth and let the other areas create contrast by roughness? And I'm going with the latter just uh, for the sake of the sharp edges of the edges of the shell. I almost knocked out my whole painting. And then just like the holly, <laughs> remember when the whole painting fell over? Yeah, this big streak of, uh, you know, rubbed out painting. That was the worst painting for that to happen too, because it puts that filmy haze in the um, in the metal, and I really wanted that metal to be um, pretty clean and shiny, reflective. Highly respect artists like you know, like Stephen Bauman and uh, who's a Stephen Forrester maybe that kind of really kind of polish everything as they go. It's not the way I want to paint, but it's conducive for this painting. I, I respect them. They, what they do is great. Uh, I'm not saying anything negative about their technique. I'm just saying I have a different preference, but. Um, I'm kind of using what they do here. Again, just trying to be adaptable. I, I like the idea of, even if there's a way that you don't really like to paint, learn it anyway. Because you never know when you want to use it. So this just kind of melting every brush stroke together instead of laying down nice, bold, you know, brush strokes. Which we still get to later, you know, if they want to add some punch to something, but so again, I'm not, I'm not criticizing their work at all. 
zero percent. I'm just saying that I'm using a technique that reminds me of what they do. Well, and everything's contrast. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So sharp, sharp little textures read strongly against smooth transitions, like smooth textures. I've got to get some more umber on my palette. Making like custom umber right now. And that's yeah. that's exactly the wrong thing to do. Instead of just stopping and getting umber, like the most convenient color and the uh, most convenient uh, pigment in all of art, <laughs> sitting there making my own. How do you make your own? Well, it's a tertiary, so you know it's going to involve all three primaries. I mean, just by definition, uh, raw umber is going to be less. You know, less pigmented toward red or yellow, so you could say it's blue, or it's it's not overtly blue though. Um, it's just not as it's just not as favoring yellow like ochre or in sienna or red like burnt sienna or burnt umber. It's just like more of a neutral brown than the rest of them. So you can start with color complements: red and green, uh, purple and yellow, orange and blue. Or you can, um, you know, tweak like uh, if you have burnt sienna on your palette. Well, you know you're going to darken it and cool it down. So adding adding blue and black to uh, burnt sienna and maybe a touch of green will give you a nice brown. I don't like formulas. So I'm saying that very tentatively because it's it's kind of a reaction. If it's too intense, then too intense and dark, then you add white, and that's going to kill the color in the, just the right way and brighten it. If you need to warm it up and dull it down, you can add some of these opaque uh, yellows. If uh, if you want to enhance it and enrich it, you have all these rich darks to play with. But you're going to involve all three primaries in some form or fashion. And you can always gray down that color in a brown direction with the with the color complement. And so, like, say you're you're mixing along, you think you're following a good formula, but it turned out too green. Add some alizarin crimson, or you know, even some burnt sienna. Okay, so that red will mix with the green. Green, green. You know, you're gonna have reflected light wavelengths of yellow and blue. And red is the third primary, tertiary. So that, that's maybe a little analytical, not a lot of feel, but again, it's a combination. So if you have, if you develop a feel and you have the theory to back it, then your decision making is going to be pretty well informed and pretty creative at the same time. Because there can be a big time disconnect between uh, art theory and art expression. Big time disconnect. Like you can get really analytical and really have no feel in your work. It's not mutually exclusive, but overthinking can really kill a painting. And that's that's why I keep saying is like we learn a lot of these things on the subconscious level. Learn them so well that you don't even have to think about them. Now I'm saying them out loud because this is a demonstration, but. Uh, I normally don't talk to myself this much while I'm painting. <laughs> You're like, I hope so. <laughs> My teacher is crazy. <laughs> it's all fun. It's getting there. 
Getting there. I can't wait to get to those edges. I could have done it by now. I just thought this egg back here was, it was nice in its simplicity until everything else got dynamic and then it stood out like it was dull and boring. Um, so I'm fixing that now. And I need to get rid of some outlines on that one. I could just jump the gun and do some of these edges. It's no problem. I want to tone this one down. I think it's too bright. It's commanding too much attention. I don't mind that these transitions aren't perfect. I think they're good enough. Um, so if I get to those, I get to those. But yeah, the edges on this one, and I'm glad I'm fixing the issue of this just looking dull. I don't mind it being duller than this, but there is a too much, and it was too much. And like right right now, I just have to be patient because I'm not I'm not going with the single brush strokes that make things so sort of bold and powerful. I'm doing these little smashing together tickling technique. <laughs> it's like I'm tickling the painting. It's just not the way I like to paint, but it's it's worth it for this one. So I like the idea that the cast shadow is picking up a lot of the environment. So I want a lot of the environment color into the cast shadow. So not only does that keep the accents pretty small, like if you're thinking of a range of values from one to 10, one in, one in 10 ought to be pretty special. Like you shouldn't have those everywhere. Now I don't see this in the painting, but there's a lot of potential for it of the refracted light or not project, not uh, not refracted, projected light. So I'm going to have uh, the light pass through the glass into the cast shadow. It's going to be like an uh, an outline of dark with a brightness that fades aggressively into the dark. And since I'm not able to observe it and I'm making it up. It might just take a little bit of an iteration to get to that point where it works because, again, it's in my head. It's not, it's not in, it's not observable. So that kind of works. I like that. All right. That was just a little field trip away from where I was trying to concentrate. That's important. I like that a lot, actually. Just, you know, you've been ha ha hacking away at a small spot. It's not even that I was frustrated. It just needed a little break. It was just a little, uh, you know, moment to get, uh, take care of some eye fatigue. So it wasn't like I had to take a break from this egg. It was just, I'm well, just nice to. And then I added a little creative element that I don't see, but I wanted to see. And so I'm getting really close to part of the painting that I'm really excited about. And this is those little craggy edges. Just don't want to paint around. That goes for any detail spot on any painting I paint. Just don't want to paint around detail. Want it just a little bit brighter of an environment for that highlight. I'll put it right back on. I like the idea of that getting a lesser highlight than that, even though this is really in the painting and that's not part of that creative process. Is it just needs to be believable. It just it doesn't have to be beholden to the. In this case, this is from life, but not even to photographs or anything. There's just a bunch of possibilities that are believable. I want to want to create a painting. I don't want to I don't want to faithfully copy. All right, cool. Now edges, 
edges and then I'll make the foreground even more exciting. And then, I don't know, I'll just check, check what, I, what I feel is uh, worth it in the scheme of the law of diminishing returns. So the way that works is there, there's going to be a certain point where the painting works and every new addition will only help marginally. It makes it optional. It's like the painting could be done at any stage, but if I add this next thing, it's going to have very little impact. And sometimes that's worth it and sometimes it's not. And it depends on the person. And for me, it also depends on the painting. So uh, a lot of people are really consistent in their subject matter and style. I'm not. I like to paint what I want to paint and I want to paint it how I want to paint it. And a lot of times that can look really different from painting to painting. And that's what keeps me happy as an artist, but uh, it doesn't really, doesn't make galleries happy, that's for sure. Um, they want a consistent product. They want a brand that they can market. But for me, it's worth it because I love it. I love mixing it up. And um, I, I don't want to be a put, put into a box of technique that feels foreign to me. So those, those Friday experiments, I don't, I, I would say nine times out of 10, when I tell people that I do these crazy experiments, they're like, well, why do you do that? <laughs> I really enjoy it. The challenges. I mean, it is true that if you, if you can problem solve way outside of your comfort zone, it's going to make you a stronger artist. It's definitely going to make you a better teacher because you can, I mean, a lot of times fine art teaching is more about problem solving than anything. You're looking at somebody's artwork and diagnosing how to make it better on the fundamentals. So this challenge is really helpful for that because it, it takes me way outside of my comfort zone on most challenges. This, this last one was difficult in that it was really hard to layer paint. Like a, a super, super slick service. But that was a lot of fun, especially at the end when I could change the background. <laughs> I mean, I changed the background like 20 times. Maybe not that many, but it was a lot. That was a lot of fun. Wish I had a little bit more time. If I had, if I had that extra half an hour, that would have made a big difference. So really a two and a half hour painting. How big was that plexiglass? It must be like 30 by 40. About that. That's what I think. So do a 30 by 40 a la prima of a figure model who's slumping the whole time because she's sick. Or not sick, but she said, you know, that car accident. But didn't she say she didn't feel well on top of that? Or was that the same issue? Yeah, that was good of you to ask. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm glad you did that. I probably should have. I'm glad you did. Yeah. Everyone else in the in the listening, introduce yourself. Talk to us. We're talking about things that you have to be at the Schuler School to know. Um, there was a few here. I guess they might have tuned out. There's one on you. Uh, ah, there used to be some on YouTube. <laughs> I guess I started yammering about private stuff for too long, or not private, but like inside stuff. All good. It's getting late too. I think it's hard to stay focused for a three-hour demonstration. How? How? What time is it? It's almost midnight. Four minutes till midnight. All right. So almost three hours. I need a 
need to brighten this shit. Say again? No, not anymore. <laughs> Not this time. No, uh, yeah, they're usually, they would have usually been in the painting. Like jumping on the still life setup, jumping on my lap. I have several paintings where, you know, you can tell what year it is by the, the cat on my lap. I think while I was painting that uh, Lanterns painting, I had Turp on my lap, Turpentine. Yeah. Turpy. Everyone thought it was because of the uh, University of Maryland. Now, he was the cat that lost all his teeth. He had some kind of autoimmune thing, and all of his teeth fell out. Like, at first, it was like his front fang, and we were like, what the heck? Did you bite something? Or did you did you attack something? I mean, what, what happened? And then they all just started falling out. And we, we got him looked at, and um, they were saying it was some kind of autoimmune thing. But he was all right without teeth. He didn't knew. Did yeah, just soft food. He'd stick his little tongue out and be really cute. I like that inside reflection. It looks so pretty. Which one? The inside reflection of that is. Oh, the, the gray inside glow thing? Yeah. Great. Right. Well, I'd like. You know, the more I'm in school, the more I, I look at stuff. Uh huh. And it's, um, you know, it helps me see so much more. Yeah, I mean, I like doing demos at the school, but I don't like to make it at the expense of teaching. Right. So, That's why this is perfectly. So, yeah, I like doing these. And I like the Friday night too, because then a lot of the students get to see me like really, you know, concentrated. Right. But having said that, I mean, if I don't have something to listen to, like earlier I was just kind of talking through the process and then, uh, you know, we're having a nice chit chat. It, it would drive me pretty crazy if I didn't have some kind of like visual or audible break from the painting. Like, so I usually have like a book or something going or sometimes a movie or something, but I mean, I, I kind of like it better with having people attend and <laughs> well, I couldn't do what I'm doing now, not even 10 years ago. Yeah, I'm just saying it's extremely beneficial. Oh. And even when you, uh, you know, in school, when you sit at our easel, I mean, if we're working, it's really great to watch you do what you do because you have that experience, you know what I mean? Did you get as much out of it when I was annotating on the screen? Back in the COVID days? Yeah. I okay. Did. I mean, you know, I know more now than I did then. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's all been, well, for one thing, when you were doing it on the screen, you mean like through the Zoom meeting? Yeah. Yeah, because, um, you know, I wasn't, I mean, I was nervous then, but on the screen, 
if I wasn't as nervous. Okay. When I was there in person at the school by myself, I was extremely nervous. And I, I couldn't concentrate that much. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's not your problem. It's my problem. I like what you've been painting lately, and I like the little experiments. Like we're playing with gold leaf now, and um, you know, you're, you're kind of pushing the envelope on what you're painting. It's good, very good. I did some pretty crazy uh, projects when I was a student, just because I knew I had that safety net of you know the instructors to help me pull it together. But I did some doozies. I did, uh, I told you about the centaur. Yeah, you did. Yeah, I'm going to have to hunt that down. I'll have to show you what that looked like. Because it, it totally fell apart before I could cast it. And I guess that's a little misleading because it had been sitting up in the third floor for probably about five years before it fell apart. <laughs> so let's not say it happened right away. But... That was a sculpture. It was a really ambitious one. I did some really ambitious copies. Huh? That didn't have wings, did it? No, it didn't have wings. Uh, it was half man, half horse, but yeah. what, what was really important to me on that painting was that um, that I connected the anatomy of the horse to the man. Like, I wanted to figure it out. I wanted to figure out how I could make uh, muscle move bone and have it make sense. Right. Now, Douglas totally shot that down in all the right ways. And I'm not, I'm not mad at him or anything. I'm just saying, like, I was telling him how I was really trying to figure out how to connect the musculature and bones together to make it move properly. And then he goes, well, would it have two sets of organs? It's like, Man, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> Why would you have a barrel chest for the horse if you didn't have a second set of organs in there? Like, okay, that's that's good thinking. <laughs> it is. No, that was good thinking. I don't know why I didn't think about that. Because I, I think it was a part of my diatribe of how, like, it really doesn't make any sense to slap wings on the back of an angel if, if you don't provide just enormous muscles to push those wings. Like birds are all chest because they have to flap those wings and propel themselves forward. And that's, you know, they have the hollow bones to support that and everything. Like their, their proportions are all chest muscles. And um, like you can't just slap wings on the back of something and, and let it fly. Yeah, that's makes sense. But uh, that's what I was thinking when I did that um, centaur. And that was kind of inspired by, I almost took uh, a workshop with Andrew Cars. And um, I probably, in hindsight, I should have done it. I was completely set up to do it. I had a place to stay in San Francisco in Gold Studio. Uh, my mother was going to put up the tuition for it. All I had to do is buy a flight and get out there. Just didn't do it. I think I decided instead to just paint and stay at, you know, stay back and learn from my grandmother. It was only going to be two weeks, but I, I, I don't know. I, I think in hindsight, it was a big mistake not to. That would have been a really cool workshop. And I think, he is a tremendous artist. What were you, um, what does he do? I mean, I know he's an artist, but what does he do? He did, uh, I don't know if he was a part of the more recent uh, Avatar, but he was, he was doing a lot of the artwork for Avatar, the first one. Wow. He did a lot of, um, like, ZBrush and, you know, like, did digital sculpture and, um, he does real physical sculpture too. You know, uh, it's C A W 
RSE, horrors. Australian guy, C A W R S E, Andrew Cars. Tremendous artist. Not one of those big names because of, uh, you know, galleries and magazines and stuff like that, but um, amazing artwork. If you look up anatomytools.com, I think that was his company. That's where we got that ecroche from. That really good ecroche, the, um, that, that resin one. And he has an entire formula of how the like proportional breakdown of that sculpture is. So he was running workshops where like tier one would be do a reference pose at crochet and there was a male and female. Uh, tier two was um, to do uh, an action figure at crochet. Tier three was animal. And tier four was fantasy. But fantasy had to be, if you were going to do an exoskeleton, it had to make sense anatomically. If you were going to do uh, wings, it had to be supported by bones and muscles. If you were going to do extra limbs, they had to be supported by, you know, the musculature and the bone. Like, to me, that concept was brilliant. That's, that was partly behind uh, that, that standard to make sure that the centaur had to make sense anatomically to support the horse musculature and uh, skeleton with the human, with the uh, like the lumbar spine going into the shoulder girdle of the horse. And I just thought it, I just thought it was fascinating. What's that? Very. Very difficult, but very rewarding. I mean, I don't know for sure because I didn't take it, but it sounded like it. Like I said, I, I kind of regret not doing it. Can you tell me how you spell that again? C-A-W-R-S-E. So I'm found it. Oh, um, he's the guy from the anatomy tool. Is that what you said? Yeah. And that's where we got that air crochet from. And somewhere in the school, somewhere in the school, we have an instructional video from him. But yeah, it should be probably around the TV area. Andy and I were watching it and we just, we were pretty distracted because we were making fun of his Aussie accent. It's really thick. <laughs> Yes, we're, we're petulant children. <laughs> but his, he has like demos on, um, on his website, anatomy tools. And um, like he'll do tutorials of how to make like a skull and ZBrush, which is another thing I want to learn how to do. It's digital sculpture. I I found um, I mean, I find difficult to to navigate the the programming, but at the end of the day, it's just the same fundamentals. Like you're still using anatomy, you're still using uh, the properties of light, you're still using, you know, uh, you know, digitally, you're adding this volume to create this effect, you know, to get the use of the feel of it. Yeah, that's hard, but. So here we are. 
this stage of the vein, I feel like those are really dull. I'm starting to get some edges on this to make it more exciting. I feel like I can get away with a little bit more of a turning shadow right here and get that nice and exciting. Um, I think I should probably go a tiny bit darker for that glow on the inside of the egg. But I'm at, I'm at a wrap up stage. I think it's pretty close. I'm not gonna call it perfect. I'm not even gonna call it my best egg painting. But I'm happy with it. It took some rescue though. I mean, in the beginning, it's just, you know, I, I go for really bold right off the bat and it just wasn't bold. That's what I was reacting to. It's just, you know, not, not worth complaining about, but. I'm a little sloppy about posting on Instagram. I've been posting them on YouTube pretty consistently. So I need to, I need to backtrack a few on Instagram, but yeah, I usually speed them up to about 10 minutes and dub over it and talk about the process. But yeah, 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 you'll see that. Um, I've been noticing just through research that some of the more successful videos are a little longer format. So I might, I might dub this one to 30 minutes. Still yet to put out more umber, which is such a lazy, bad thing to do to paint without the equipment that you need. <laughs> well, I know how to color mix. It's not bad. I do. I do know how to color mix. So. So, well, I mean, okay, so it's the idea of, uh, yeah, when you know how to color mix, you can mix all the browns, but why? You know, why would you? You know, umber, umber dries fast, it's stable, it's transparent-ish, it's rich. Well, no, it's not rich, it's the opposite. It's, it's, it's dull, which is just as important as having rich. Um, and I'm going to just stop complaining and do it. <laughs> There's really no excuse not to. It takes two seconds. <laughs> you know what would have been nice in this painting, and I have it, is a green umber. That would have been perfect for turning that red, like the brown red of the eggs. Well, it's color complement, but it's also dull. I mean, not dull, but low chroma. So it's barely green, it's mostly brown. And um, yeah, mixing that with the with the brown red of the egg would have made this beautiful gray. I didn't think about it until right now. Now I've got my, my full range of effects with my umber. I don't need it. I've painted plenty of paintings without umber, but I really like it. It's like a Liz Ring Crimson. I, if I don't have it, I miss it. I'm not paralyzed without it, but I really like having it. So right now I'm just going to carve some really sh super sharp edges, single brush strokes, and then finesse where I need to. And then this is going to be pretty close. I do want to tweak the um, foreground just a little, 
give me that. Um, A little bit more of that reflection and a little bit of roughness that would make the eggs even extra smooth. Another one that was just nice, not necessary, but nice. So this is a this this technique is radically different than the other ones. I'm painting these kind of Smashing it together, brush strokes instead of, you know, bold. And, um, you know, I'm using these tiny brushes, whereas those are usually just finishing touches. But every paint, every painting has its personality. I'm going to turn the form, but not by brightening the middle, but by darkening the outside edges. Maybe I'm going to let it mix with the gray a little bit. I'm thinking of maybe radiating the eggs into the background. I don't know if this painting needs it. And maybe it'll look a little out of character. So that's what I'm looking out for. What do you think? Oh, about radiating the colors of the egg into the gray of the background? Normally that works better when, okay, normally that works a lot better when the background is really dark. So it'd probably work better here than here. Um, No, you're going to have this color work into the gray. Oh, kind of like a, like a, uh, like an operator, like an operator effect? A what effect? Ombre. Ombre? You think the color gradually changes? Um, well, the way I think about it is light does radiate. That's the way we see it. And that would be that light radiating into the background. So we don't see that per se. I mean, we might see a little bit of a glow, but the way artists do it is way overdone, quite on purpose, artistic license. And it can look really nice. Like, uh, you know, even some of the students that I've taught, you know, Blair does it sometimes, Nick and uh, David Chaffetz. Like they, they do that a lot. I don't do it to copy anybody. Just sometimes the painting just needs a little bit more oomph, and that's a nice way to do it. But I almost never do it as a really big nuclear kind of blowout type thing, like uh, maybe David does. I think that you asked me if you did that on uh, like apple and green bottle paint. Oh. All right, well, let me just show you what it would look like on this. Yeah, uh, no, it is a nice effect. And by, my, by me saying that other people do it more than I do with like big nuclear reaction radiation thing is, uh, no, I really like those paintings. But I, don't, I don't ever try to copy artists. Sometimes I'm inspired to do uh, my version of an effect and I, I'll give it a try. But um, I never really say it's like, oh, I want to, I want to be more like this person or that person. Um, but sometimes it can just be a variation of uh, of a technique. So like, if I take all this red and work into this gray softly, just bear in mind it's going to look bad at first. So I'm working this into the gray, and then I'm going to fan it out. So I can still see the egg and it's radiating into this darkness. 
Now, I could even go a tiny bit bolder than that because I fanned it out a little bit more than I had to. But then it's just a matter of the degree that you're comfortable with. So I don't really want to bring a ton of attention back here. So in one way, it helps in that I don't have the razor sharp edge. And the other way, it hurts in that it's a visual interest thing. And I just got to decide what works for the painting. So in this one, I would take the, the white and glow it into the background. You have, but you don't have to do it everywhere, do you? I don't have to do it at all. It's always totally optional because even though light is uh, radiating out, and that's why we see it, you know, reflecting light, yeah. it's that's obviously an over overblown version of that idea. It's an artist, it's an artist's exaggeration, really. I guess my question is, you, since you did it on the one space, you, you don't have to do it on the other space, do you? Um, it would, it would make sense for this one to radiate, too. Okay. I don't think anybody would say, ah, you made a big mistake here. <laughs> but to me, I like it when I can just discern what makes sense and doesn't. And then at least I can make up my own mind as to whether it's worth it. Um, so it's not, it's not ignored out of ignorance. I mean, it wasn't like neglected out of ignorance. It's it neglected out of choice. Or I can put it in. Basically, you're saying that bright things radiate their light and it puts it into dark. Look at the, if you look at the moon, You'll see that sort of radiating light around it. So it, it's real. It's just artists overdo it on purpose. This? I like that the head doesn't have a hard edge. So if I went bolder than that, I think it would be a problem. But I, I like it the way it is. That is good feedback. Good. Um, and it's getting close. We're probably getting pretty close to that point of uh, diminishing returns to where yeah, I could keep adding stuff, but it's not going to contribute much to the overall enjoyment of the painting. I think I've gotten past the point where there's there's no glaring errors, I don't think. Maybe I'd discover one if I walked away. But, but I don't think there's any glaring. Just gonna expand this up a tiny bit. Yeah, that was nice. You know, it's funny, after complaining that I'm not doing the right thing by getting the umber, I'm still using that one that I made from scratch. It's like, what am I doing? <laughs> it's funny. I, I, I don't know why. Silly. Our neighborhood that might be rabbits. That's no good. 
Why do you say that? Like during the daytime? Yeah, because it doesn't look good. Ah, oh, poor thing. Kind of makes you look at it. It's so confused. Oh. I haven't seen him yet, but so usually I take a walk at night. That sound that they make is awful. What? They're, the sound? Yeah, there's yeah. a sound that they make late. I guess late at night when they have like they're young or something, or maybe it's mating season, I don't know. But they make this blood curling scream almost. I know, it is scary. It's like a baby getting hurt or something. It's like we used to have them in our neighborhood when we lived up on Northern Parkway. And it just that chill just I mean that that's that sound would just put a chill up your spine. It's awful. <laughs> it's like one of the worst sounds you can hear. <laughs> but I like Fox. I'm not, you know. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't think it would be coming from an animal like that. Yeah, it's awful. Really bad sound. <laughs> All right, so. What does this need? I like these real fine outlines. Rare when outlines are the right thing to do, but in these edges of the eggshells, it's really great. Yeah. I think this could be more dramatic. I like I like how pink that is. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go darker and pinker for this inside of the glow. I think that would be nice. And I'll let it fade to this brighter stuff on the inside. And it's this technique of just smashing paint together. It's just not my way, but. Working for this one. This this edge here bothers me. It's accurate to what I see, but I don't like it. So I either need to take the edge away from the shell or bring it further in. And I'm going to bring it further in. Again, such a nitpicky little thing, but. I think it's worth a fix. And now I'll reestablish that. Highlight. That's infinitely better. Such a minor little thing, but I feel like it really makes a big difference. It was like two tangent edge with that glow right there. Right, right. Tangent edge doesn't show that very well. What did you call it? Tangent? Tangent. Yeah, tangent meaning just kind of touching against. Yeah, I know what you mean by it. Yeah. yeah, it's better to leave a gap or an overlap. Sometimes you get stuck with them, and sometimes it makes sense. But a lot of times, even if I see it that way, I'll, I'll change it to be not a tangent edge. Right. All right. 
let's rough up the foreground and see if what happens when I walk away from it. And if it looks good at that point, then I think it's done. Yeah. Sign it. I already have a frame for it. Is that an eight by ten? Uh. No. Sure. I I think it goes into a frame that was an odd size, and that's why I wanted to use it. Um, because those frames line up in the frame shop, and they just get damaged, and then we end up throwing them out. So if I can if I can use them. At least I clear out a bit of an inventory and they don't go to waste. Yeah, Alaprima glass. I mean, glass is not a, a really great Alaprima subject. Just because uh, it's kind of better if you can glaze some of the middle tones to have the background coming through it and to get some of the subtlety wet into wet like it's not like you can superimpose it over a dry background so all these little corrections are a little trickier than if the painting dried but yeah i'm happy with how it turned out especially the glass i mean the eggs had to go through a little bit of battle to get them to where I wanted. But that's just the nature of painting sometimes. Add an impasto right here. So I could blow this out into the background. I don't know. I don't know how important that is. I'll make up my mind on that after the foreground. So the foreground, now that I know exactly where the eggs are, I'm going to go a little bit bolder with the uh, reflection. And that looks nice. And I'll put a little dot of highlight in there. I don't know. I like that. I liked it when it was even bolder than that. So I'm going to put some of that even further back before I spread it out. This. All right, so I'm going to step back from that, see what it looks like. Might even be able to get away with slightly darker for the foreground. Let's see what that looks like too. I know I already brightened it up because that's what I felt like it needed at the time, but. Missed. Try 
Yeah, you know. What do you think? All right. That looks great. What do you think about the reflections? I love them. Yeah? Yep. You think it's done? You think I should go darker in that upper left? I think it's done. I think it's perfect. Perfect? What? <laughs> you, don't, you don't like it? It's not that I dislike it. I wouldn't say perfect. I do. I like it now. I had to build a lot of drama into it, and that usually has me a little unsettled. But I, I discussed that already, saying that, um, you know, if it doesn't start bold, I get a little, I don't know, a little agitated. And it didn't start bold. What? I, I just think it's a really, really nice thing. Thanks. Appreciate that. Well, that was a bit of a mistake. Let's fix that problem. All right. Uh, whew, what else? Um, yeah, I think I'm at diminishing returns. I don't have to add anything at this point. Um, so I'm thinking I'm going to call it quits. Okay. And I will say um, good night then. Well, good night, Liz. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll see you next week, okay? Yeah, I'll be in briefly, briefly, briefly on Monday because I'll drop off that work and then I'll have to pretty much turn right around and go back to St. John's. Oh, right, for the show. No, for my class. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, I'll see you next week. I was thinking more like Wednesday. Wednesday. Wednesday we'll work on scratch boards and whatever the show needs, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be... It's going to be a busy week, I think. As always, yep. Yep. Okay, then. Um, I hope you get some sleep, okay? Thank you. I'll try. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. You're welcome. Good night. Good night.
Oh my. <laughs> So uh, is that you, Dan S, on the uh, on the chat? Yeah, I, I never, I never quite figured out how to get the light dim enough to show the still life. But I'll, I'll when I dub the video, I'll include it with the photo of the um, the eggs in the glass from where I'm sitting. But uh, hey, thanks for joining me. Uh, so glad you can make it. And I'm going to dub this and, uh, you know, it'll be more concise, maybe about a half hour, just talking through all the problem solving and concerns and fundamentals. But yeah, hope you'll join me next time. I like to do this on Saturday night. Um, so unless something unforeseen, I'll probably do it again next week. So hope you join me. So thanks.